Hello, 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 and warm welcome to the Block Start uh, final event precursor, the Blockchain Policy and Regulation Conference. It's really nice to see so many of you joining today. And uh, in this nice event with the distinguished guests that I will introduce in a few minutes, we will talk about blockchain regulation and specifically we will try to focus on uh, the decentralization aspect of regulation itself, uh, which sounds interesting for technology that is all about decentralization. Uh, and we will try to uh, address um, decentralized up, uh, bottom up uh, and other initiatives of uh, regulating this interesting technology and solutions based on the technology. Before uh, before we jump into into um, into telling what we are going to have today, um, you can see these uh, five six sorry nice uh, people uh, that I am going to introduce, and then we will have a couple of housekeeping notes. I will uh, I will uh, I, I will I will ask you to answer a couple of questions. Uh, and uh, just as a, a reminder, um, yes, uh, I will. Um, and yes, uh, the housekeeping notes. Uh, we're going to have uh, a nice poll in the beginning, uh, and also if you have questions, uh, regardless of which channel you're watching us on, please uh, come to Slido. Um, either by scanning this QR code or uh, searching for blog start on slido.com. You have an opportunity to ask questions to the speakers that we will try to address in the second part of our event today, which is going to be the panel discussion. Uh, and uh, before the panel discussion, we're going to have a uh, we're going to have presentations from five of our distinguished panelists. Uh, and let me introduce the panelists. Uh, Mr. Joachim Schwerin is the principal economist uh, on DigiGrow at the uh, European Commission. Uh, Mark Tevener is uh, executive di director of INADBA, uh, an association of trusted uh, blockchain applications. Agatha Ferreira, Chief Legal Officer at Statum and uh, sorry, Status, and she also has uh, a lot of other uh, blockchain related um, uh, blockchain related uh, uh, titles uh, in her long uh, list of, of uh, responsibilities. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ian Taylor, Executive Director of uh, Crypto UK uh, Association. Uh, Peter Novels, uh, co-owner at Vitality and uh, Calipo, and uh, Gilles Mentre, co-founder and president of Electis. Uh, five of them are going to share uh, their presentations uh, in, the, in the presentation part, and then all six of them are going to have uh, an interesting and exciting discussion about decentralized regulation of blockchain. Uh, and, and share their thoughts, and I will be moderating that uh, discussion. So before uh, before coming to the presentations, uh, I will ask you to answer a few questions. Uh, so please uh, go to slido.com slash block, block start or search for block start uh, or scan the QR code, and uh, we will ask you to answer uh, this really short poll because we want to understand a bit more about uh, the attendees uh, that we have over uh, 70 right now, as I can see, at least in some of the channels. Um, this is being broadcast not only on Zoom, but also on Facebook and YouTube Live. So please answer the, the questions. Uh, we will show the, uh, just for this curiosity sake, we will show the answers uh, a bit later after the uh, presentations. And uh, now I will ask to uh, the first presenter to take the floor, uh, Mr. Joachim Schwerin from European Commission, 
the principal economist at DG Grow. Please come on stage and uh, uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Vitautas, for the kind introduction. Thank you also for all the panelists to have really such an exciting setup for the event today. And of course, thank you to everyone who is present here today to discuss what, in my opinion, is one of the most important topics, if not the most important topic uh, in the crypto space, which is uh, what does decentralization really mean? And what are the implications uh, also for the public side? Uh, thank you for sharing my uh, presentation, which I guess you will see, and I right jump into the middle of it. Next slide, please. Um, let's make a little time journey back 13 and a half years, autumn 2008, financial crisis that started in 2007. We have two events that are at first glance not linked at all, but very telling. 15 September 2008, the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers forms the climax of the subprime mortgage crisis, and one of the I would say deepest points, if not the deepest point in the financial crisis. Just a month later, Satoshi Nakamoto publishes a paper entitled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And a few weeks later, beginning of January 2009, he mines the genesis block of the first cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. Next slide, please. So we have on the one hand side here, the central system in crisis, and we have the emergence of something completely. And what we need to realize is that actually the systemic risk that we observed in the financial crisis, but also before and also afterwards, is inherent in centralized structures. The crisis in 2007-2008 exposed the huge risks that are, I would say, permanent in legacy capital and financial markets. And the key risk factor consists in the interlinkages in the centralized system, which is consisting of interdependent financial intermediaries without adequate risk control mechanisms. And that, of course, is one part of it, which is bad enough. But the big problem, of course, is that it spills over to the real economy, to these companies, especially the smaller ones, but also normal citizens in everyday life. The crisis took a very heavy toll on the enterprise community, especially SMEs. But it also took a heavy toll on whole economies, which were, in some cases, even on the brink of complete collapse, as we might vividly recall. And for years to come, this crisis, which is part of a series of recurrent global crises in financial markets, forced regulators to turn into a defensive mode just to stabilize the legacy system, which is existing. Next slide, please. So just as a little background, what does it actually mean for the economy? Why do I speak of SMEs here? We have 25 million SMEs in Europe, small and medium-sized enterprises, and they are of absolute key importance. They employ two out of three employees. They create 85% of new jobs in Europe in a very small segment of high growth companies, and that generate about 60% of the value added that we have in the European Union. And these SMEs rely heavily on the banking system in Europe. At the time of the financial crisis, 75% of finance was through the banking system, which is much higher than in other parts of the world. And when we look at the data now, more than a decade later, what do we see? If we do not for a moment uh, look at some, I would say, uh, distortions from the COVID-19 uh, crisis with, I would say, a current peak in, in grants that we observe, the situation is absolutely as it was. 75% of finance runs through centralized legacy systems, through the banking system, also for SMEs, for innovative smart uh, startups, etc. And the banking system, as well as the macroeconomic environment in which it operates, was, is, and still remains a hotspot of systemic risk. Next slide, please. Why do I focus so much on this point? In my opinion, centralized financial structures have been a recurrent source of systemic risks with negative spillovers to the real economy. They are a problem. On the other hand, decentralized financial structures do not have such a track record. They are a solution, not a problem. I'm not saying the solution because there might be other solutions, but they are a big part of the solution. Now I hear some of you say, and I read it in the press all over, and I hear statements from very important people or people that think they should make such statements, that the decentralized space, that crypto is full of crime. So much of that is fraud. We should not trust it. The legacy system is much better. Now let the experts speak. Last week, the 2022 Chainalysis Crypto Prime Report was published, which is, I would say, one of these sources of reference because they take a critical approach uh, on all the things negative in crypto. And they state that for last year, 
transactions involving illicit addresses represented just 0.15% of cryptocurrency transactions. And this yearly trend suggests that crime is becoming a smaller and smaller part of the cryptocurrency ecosystem, 0.15%, which is much less than, for example, crime-related transactions in cash, much less than probably crime-related transactions in the banking system. So we need to consider that, that yes, we have problems, but decentralization as such is not the problem, it is a solution. Next slide, please. I will not go into all of the details uh, of the benefits of tokenization and the crypto space, which is very known to you. I've just listed a few here on these slides. Advantages for financing, especially for smaller companies, for startups, financial inclusion, improved competitiveness, the tokenization of whole ecosystems, the whole aspect of programmable money, CBDCs, uh, private stable coins, uh, digital euro, whatever you name it. There's a lot of advantages that we see in the crypto space and which are worthwhile exploring. Next, next slide, please. So um, what we have done, uh, we were looking a bit more into detail with our partners on what actually these benefits consist of in practice. One study that we've made, uh, DigiGo, together with the JRC of the European Commission, it's quite a bit old, but I can still recommend it. And I took the graphic from there as just a prototypical industrial ecosystem, shows what the use case is not only in terms of finance, but also in terms of the real economy should be. And we have published a report that is still worthwhile reading, Blockchain for Industrial Transformation, that lists for nine prototypical sectors the benefits of tokenization and uh, the move into the blockchain space. And all of that is emerging. We have already a lot of things actually in practice that we saw three, four years ago were still visions, and we would like to see how that develops. Part of that has already been implemented, and this is growing together. This is growing together in the whole functionality that there is, not only in terms of services, as said, it all started with finance, but also in terms of real applications on the ground in our industrial ecosystems. Next slide, please. And all of these benefits are uh, the reason why we at the European Commission have already six, seven years ago taken the decision to focus our policy work on DLT on blockchain. We have identified in a report made in 2015, published in 2016, that blockchain is one of the key breakthrough technologies for Europe in the decades to come, and that all policy areas need to refocus their attention on supporting blockchain, fully realizing that blockchain is a decentralized approach. So we knew very well what we are doing, because at the outset, we had done our work on the financial crisis. We had seen the risks in the centralized space, we had seen that with crowdfunding and alternative finance, there were already things developing that could be seen as part of the solution. And we wanted to leverage that, to develop that, to support that. And this is what the commitment in 2016 publicly we made is that we are supportive of this decentralized space. Next slide, please. Since then, we have taken a journey. And I'm not going to all the detail you hear. Uh, that with the post-crisis management starting 2008, where basically we were, I would say, repairing the system. We were then looking into all the individual parts of digitalization, and now we are putting them together in a coherent manner, moving towards a digital, or as I would like to call it, a token economy. And we've presented a couple of initiatives over the last couple of years. We have presented a digital strategy. We have presented a strategy for small and medium-sized enterprises, which includes actions for finance based on blockchain and also education on blockchain. We have industrial activities. We have the digital financial strategy of September 2020 that, for example, includes the MICA regulation, markets and crypto assets regulation, but also a DLT pilot regime and others. And now we are looking on additional aspects. We are looking into the digital euro, which we want to develop. We are looking on taxation of crypto assets in the context of DAC8. We are looking on a data act to improve the portability of data, but also have first steps on addressing smart contracts and things like that, that is yet to come. I would say this is the culmination of a journey that started with the financial crisis and brought us to the space that offers solutions where we now are. Next slide, please. This is the most important part that brings us to decentralization. And I'm not giving here in my short presentation full answers, but I just intend to set a little bit the scene for the uh, presentations of the very distinguished speakers that we have after us, and then the discussion, which will be very exciting. Um, what is important to see is that we have shifted, we have shifted, I'm saying that in past tense, we have shifted to a new paradigm in terms of governance, in terms of regulation, in terms of policy making. In the past, we had a top-down 
approach and we thought we could afford it. We had an approach for mature markets, limited number of incumbents, few new competitors, very slow pace of innovation, regulation and long cycles, you had a piece of regulation, you revised it five, six, seven years later, it worked and you knew more or less what you were. It worked more or less for banking, for securities, for traditional capital markets. Now with all the pace of innovation, with all the developments in the decentralized space, we need it, and I think it's a good thing, move to a completely different approach towards regulation, which is a bottom-up approach. We have emerging markets, no established incumbents, disruptive innovation for the market. The speed of innovation outpaces the speed of regulation. You cannot see and regulate all of that in advance. You have an open, a fluid approach where basically regulation needs to become something that moves with the space of decentralized innovation. And the examples are those that we have been discussing here over the last few minutes. Next slide, please. So this is extremely important to see, and we have already implemented it. In my opinion, a good example for that is a part of a structure of the draft MICA regulation, which we hope to conclude in the political discussions uh, in the near future, and then that it enters into the force, hopefully, uh, later this year. And if you look at the structure of the MICA regulation, only for those that know how regulation works, not to bore the others, we have three big pillars. And the first pillar is actually an article for the exemption. Things that are financial regulation, where we say it's not regulated at all. And these are small scale projects. These are projects that have a limited number of investors, but this is also cryptocurrency mining and other things. Uh, there's a big discussion on to what extent that is DeFi or not. We can come to that in the discussion. But this is basically regulation saying that we are not regulating the decentralized space. Of course, you still have rules that apply. You have uh, civil law, you have other things, but this is what we say. And then the biggest part is the second pillar for crypto assets except stable coins and e-money tokens and i will not now in this short presentation speak on them we can do that later the big part of that is for i would say utility tokens everything that is really for also real economy applications is a very light regulation you send a white paper which is not a prospectus to your regulator and then a few days later you do what you want and the burden of proof is on the regulator to demonstrate that this is bad and needs to be prohibited the burden of proof is not on you to show that it works or that it's good. This is a complete difference to past centralized structured regulation. And when you have sent this white paper, you have a passport for the whole EU, actually, which is a novelty. So I think this is in practice what basically I'm saying about a new type of regulation. Next slide, please. Uh, I will wrap up in, in the last two, three minutes very quickly because we have thankfully a lot of time for uh, discussion. One thing that I find extremely important is to focus that it's nice to speak about technology, it's nice to speak about use cases, it's nice to speak about regulation, but the most important thing of all is knowledge, is information, is learning. So we have stepped up heavily in the recent months, and we're doing that in the future much more, a focus on digital education and skills. And digital skills, we have a definition on that. I'm not going into that in detail. It's on the slide where basically it's relatively broad. It's on data, it's on safety, cybersecurity, it's on problem solving in a digital context, many different aspects. And everyone, including any small company, any citizen that is somehow active or affected by the digital space needs to have some basic digital skills. And that also applies to a technology such as blockchain. Blockchain, in essence, is a very simple technology. It is just a digital ledger, and ledgers have been around for millennia. But, of course, it has many implications in the uh, business models that there are. And therefore, the learning needs to come not only for those that develop these business models, but especially for those that guide them politically or that regulate them. So what we need us spaces for co-learning, for public-private co-learning spaces, sandboxes, which we have also introduced and will do more in the future, education platforms, etc., for a co-learning process between the private and public side. That, for me, is a very key ingredient to any discussion on how we should approach decentralization. Next slide, please. On this slide, I have just given you a few examples that's for reading later on where you can find information sources on what I'm just saying. I've also included uh, Inatba, who have uh, some very important and interesting material there, knowing that Mark would speak uh, after me, but also a few of our sources and others. So if you feel that you would like to know more about that, uh, be invited to read in these uh, links or any other ones. Uh, next slide, please. And to conclude, just a few remarks that perhaps also have a bearing in our discussion later. Decentralization, as I tried to explain, has come into existence for good reasons. 
it is here, it will stay and it will continue. And it will continue and it will continue. Whatever you do in the political and the regulatory space, you will not get it away. So you should live with it. But it's getting confusing. Just a few buzzwords. We started with alternative finance. We have peer-to-peer -peer lending. We have all the crowd X things, crowdfunding, crowd innovation, crowdsourcing. We talk about industry 4.0. We talk about DeFi, Web 3.0, now the metaverse uh, on top of that. That is really something where we have a lot of different words for many times similar things or very much related things. And all of that is transferring the Internet of Information into the Internet of Value. So again here, very important to have a co-learning space to get to terms with that, but also understand the implications. And then my last two slides to conclude. Uh, so the next slide, please. Um, we are at a critical juncture. Now, this is also for me an important point also for discussions. We have the tool to move out of these gaming spaces, out of these experimental spaces, and really design meaningful digital communities that exist or coexist with our daily physical lives. So basically, a part of us will have a digital or a crypto or a virtual form and coexist with our physical life. It is there. This requires decentralized governance structures where the opportunities are exploited based on joint decision points and where the risks are shared by the community, not attributed to one individual, not because someone is just coding or someone is there by coincidence or because you have an address, but it is a responsibility of a space, a community. It is a collective thing. And these digital communities might indeed, and I'm happy to discuss that further in detail in the discussion, resemble borderless states with all the implications thereof, all the services, all the opportunities, all the risks. This reality, however, is challenged from three sides. It is challenged from central authorities defending their territory, and that is what I call the legacy system, but also autocratic states where we have good examples. It is challenged by people that pretend to be decentralized, but are the opposite, the big techs and the wannabe big techs who tell us how nice that is, but basically they are just building centralized silos with false promise of decentralization. And it's also challenged by the arrogance of some people in the DeFi, NFT, crypto community that think they know everything better and that they have no relationship with the real world. And unfortunately, that is not so. So a huge opportunity, but also huge challenges if we do not get this discussion. Right. Last slide, please. Uh, to conclude, I have made a few statements uh, here where basically I think that they can guide the discussion. So the technology creates proximity with all the implications thereof. We know that the regulators cannot really prohibit this sort of proximity or development, but they can set boundaries. They can provide an infrastructure. They can give guidance, but not more. The absence of such regulation is not the absence of rule, as we've seen, because there is a collective responsibility. And there is a lot of things that the community can do in terms of voting, in terms of decision making, in terms of communication and learning. And learning is done by doing, also by the public entities. That is also very important. And perhaps the last remark on that, the relevance of all of what we are discussing here rises and falls with the relevance of the benefits to real people. Much of what we see so far is promises, but if it only makes the rich richer, it doesn't really help advance the discussion. So we need to see, of can we structure the decentralized processes in a sense that also the normal citizens, the small companies feel safe feel incentivized, feel invited to, let's say, join the discussion, be involved in that, and then really reap the benefits. If not, this whole thing will fail. So just this a little bit as introductory remarks to, uh, to set the scene. We have much more, I would say, interesting details and, and other views to discuss, but happy to uh, listen to the other panelists and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Joachim. It was a fantastic presentation, a lot of uh, very good, good content. And uh, I could not imagine a better setting the scene uh, for our further presentations as well as for our discussion. There were some very interesting points that you raised, including the arrogance of newbies and, and uh, others that uh, I'm looking forward to discuss in the panel discussion afterwards. So thanks again, Joachim. And now we're moving to the next uh, speaker, next, presenta uh, next presentation. So please uh, join us, uh, Mark Tavenar, Executive Director of INADBA, which stands for International Association for Trusted Blockchain Applications. Looking forward to your presentation, Mark. Uh, welcome once again, and the stage is yours. 
Thank you, Vitatas, and thank you, Joachim. You certainly set the bar very high. Uh, so my name is Mark Tavener. I'm from INATPA, which is the International Association of Trusted Blockchain Applications. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a short presentation on some of the perspectives from INATPA's point of view, uh, assuming I can get into the mode that I would like to have. One second. Sorry about this. My computer has just taken a few moments at the wrong time to, to choose to freeze PowerPoint. Just let me get the slide back up and then we can get going. I do apologize. Okay. So my apologies for the slow starts there. Um, it's in keeping with my mood actually this morning. And before I started, I just wanted to, to make a personal comment, uh, if the organizers don't mind, just to let my, my friends, colleagues and peers who are in Ukraine know that we, I'm thinking of them this morning. Uh, and I hope that they all stay safe. So let's get into the topic of today's conversation. Uh, it is to do with regulation, and at Inatpa we spend a great deal of time focusing on this particular topic. Uh, by means of a short introduction, we represent approximately 170 corporate entities, companies, from across 38 countries. We've gathered together uh, a number of governments and regulators from around the world who sit on our advisory body, and we supplement that with work from esteemed academics around the world. We're supported very proudly by the European Commission and ADGM, Abu Dhabi Global Markets, and we invite anybody who would like to come and join us to visit our website, access our reports, view our papers, and take part in our activities. So, regulation. Who needs it, right? Um, I just wanted to start with this, th this short view, this very, very simple and interesting observation that was presented to me some time ago. The image you're seeing at the moment was a very early example of top-down regulation. It's from about the, the late 1800s in the UK. It represents something that became known as the red flag law. And the concept here was that when motor vehicles were invented, they were deemed to be dangerous and therefore to prevent uh, danger to the public, to protect citizens, there was a law passed that said motor vehicles were allowed to be used on the roads but to protect citizens, they had to be uh, preceded. They had to have someone working, walking in front of them, waving a red flag. And the concept here was that this throttled the speed, it reduced the speed that these vehicles could travel at. It warned oncoming users uh, that a motor vehicle, which was dangerous, was coming. And therefore, it helped to provide protection to citizens. So I put that to you as uh, an observation of potentially top-down uh, regulation. If we go forward about 200 years, then here we have technology that's developed further. This image was taken uh, from a very high performance sports car traveling on the Autobahn in Germany. The speed that was hit was just under 420 kilometers an hour. So over 200 years, we developed the technology and perhaps this is a form of self-regulation where we now have technology that can travel at very, very high speeds, and we place the responsibility on the individual to choose when to ex exercise those speeds. So with that setting the scene, I wanted to go to the central question that the, the organizers of today's event asked us to focus on, which is our top-down regulation and decentralized essence of blockchain compatible? Uh, I'd like to step through a few examples of some of our members to, to try and draw some logic as to why we're having this, this discussion. So the reason we're having this discussion is because blockchain has created a huge amount of innovation and potential for change. We've seen, seen that uh, is very important, uh, particularly for citizens who are looking for new mechanisms of trust organizations who are looking how to reimagine trust and certainly in some of the geopolitical situations we're seeing at the moment 
citizens who would like to have more control over their digital assets. So if we look at some of the examples where blockchain is driving innovation, we see traditional markets and some of our members, and this is just a small selection of our members, uh, their logos are on the right hand side, where they're beginning to see how blockchain can help efficiency of existing models and existing processes. And that's very interesting because as you will note from the brands, some of these names are very large, very established. They are fundamental to the structure of some of the financial markets that, that we're talking about this morning and that Joachim referenced really well. So that's presenting blockchain as an efficiency gain. But I think the most interesting piece is really around the new models, the new trust models, the new business models, the new ways of creating stakeholder engagement, the new models of delivering governance, reimagining how we could do just about everything. And we're very proud of that, but to have a, a good selection of these early innovators, these established players who are building approaches to decentralized autonomous organizations, the token economy, and various other aspects of this innovation. And this is you know, a fascinating area where the whole topic about what is regulation, how should regulation be applied, really begins to get, gain traction. And, and then the final example I wanted to talk to you about where blockchain is providing a raft of innovation is around access to data and the ability to analyze what is happening and the free access to this, whereby anybody, granted you do need some, some education, you need some technical skills, but within reason, anybody can access the data and begin to understand what's happening and who's doing what. And this additional transparency together with the trust models and the efficiency that blockchain can bring, these three things together create really compelling reasons as to why blockchain is challenging the thinking around regulation because it's presenting new business models new structures for organizations, new ways of spinning up projects that are without geographical boundary. And that presents challenges to traditional forms of regulation. So what are the traditional forms of regulation? So looking from the bottom up, these are some of the arguments that we hear presented to us at Inatba oftentimes when we're talking with regulators. So blockchain models can have inbuilt regulatory approaches uh, sorry, the, this is the bottom up from the industry perspective. And what the industry tells us is that blockchain models can have inbuilt regulatory approaches, which can act as preventative measures to ensure stability of market, to ensure protection for the participants in those markets, and to ensure balance sheet protection. We also hear that the blockchain industry is motivated to self-police. And some of these examples I, I draw here are very broad and you will have seen in, in the popular press. So the industry is able to respond and correct problems to help limit market risks. And the earliest example of that was a 2000, 2016 DAO attack, where there was an actual pivot, there was a change in the direction of an entire blockchain to try and negate uh, a, a fault that was identified in the code and an exploit that was taking place from a bad actor. The other fact that we're presented with from the bottom up view is that should a hack or a theft occur, those stolen or hacked funds can be identified, they can be tracked, they can be blocked, and maybe even eventually returned to the owners to try and make them whole again. An example of that again goes back to 2016 and is in current news today with the Bitfinex hack. Now, Given that was a good number of years ago, I think this is a great example because it have out, has elements of the first point I made about being able to correct a problem and eventually think about returning funds to those individuals that had the funds or the tokens taken from them. But also it is evidence of how those individuals, those perpetrators can be tracked over time, identified and then eventually held to account as well. And the third point that is often made to us is that the community is able to monitor activities, rapidly alert faults or hacks, alert users, and therefore effectively self-police, if you will, from a bottom-up perspective. And a more recent example of that was the OpenSea exploit, uh, where last weekend, for those of you that may have been watching, the community was very active in spotting this rapidly 
and sending alerts out to allow individuals to intervene and to protect themselves or those individuals that may have been affected to go back to the provider and to begin working on a solution. So there's some of the bottom up or self-regulatory arguments that we hear. But then you have to balance that with the top down view. So from a regulatory perspective, when we're talking to governments and regulators, what we hear very often is that the blockchain sector, the crypto sector, is now almost too big to ignore. And we take the value today as approximately 1.75 trillion US dollars from coin market cap, that's as of yesterday. But I think the key driver here was not just the value of the market, it was the potential of the market to scale. And what really captured the imagination when, was, when there was discussion around stable coins and the concept that stable coins would be issued or may be issued without approval from a regulatory body and without permission from a particular government. So at that point, I think we started to see regulators really sit up and take notice because there was what they perceived as a threat to the market structure or market stability. The second point that we hear very often, and Joachim uh, referenced this, is that there is relentless and fast-paced innovation. And that can compound both product innovation, where innovation is built on innovation and therefore you get this accelerator effect, but if the approach is not correct, then it can also compound risk. And some of the thinking back to uh, some of the maximalist comments that Joachim referenced is that with, with the various waves where we've seen crypto, then ICO, DeFi, NFT, what's next? Is it the metaverse? So there's a little bit of concern that without regulatory structures, we could be unleashing something that could create such scale that it's very hard to pull back and ensure that citizens are protected. And then the final point that we hear is that the regulatory aim is always to uphold first principles, which by and large are very good because they're here to protect us as consumers. They're there to protect market integrity, and they're also there to ensure that some form of balance sheet protection is available to try and make individuals who might suffer some loss whole again, at least in part. And oftentimes, whilst this isn't part of the regulatory mix, we do hear that there are fears that uneducated consumers might be exposed to risk. And this theme around education keeps popping up over and over again. It's something that we at Inatpa are focused on greatly. In fact, we're part of a Chaise Consortia, which is a project that seeks to establish a blueprint for educational skills strategy across Europe. And we also have a number of our members. An example of that is Quant, who's working not just to try and build a skill strategy, but is working to try and enhance the skills of developers. And to that point, it's not just the private sector. We're also seeing some regulators talk about building secondment schemes to try and transfer knowledge from the private sector into their entities so that they can create a better understanding. Our finance work group consists of over 150 private contributors. And through this work, we are producing papers, we are producing educational documents. Please do check out our website where we've got a series running on DAO, DeFi, NFTs, and that will culminate in a call for a sandbox to bring regulators in the private sector together to go on a learning journey. We do see some regulators ready to adapt. We do see regulators ready to work. So to answer the question from Inatpa's perspective, we do not see incompatibility between the concept of top-down regulation and the potential for bottom-up self-regulation. But we do see a gaping gap around education and engagement. To help that, we at Inatba produce and distribute to our members a bi-weekly policy newsletter, an example of which you can see on the screen. And that aims to try and track some of the policy developments that are happening in, the, in Europe and in the US so that we can share that knowledge. And a selection of the regulatory files from a European perspective that we're tracking at the moment, the marketing crypto assets, which is a fantastic uh, first step for Europe that will bring some legal clarity and classification to operations, both in crypto asset and crypto asset service providers in 30 countries in Europe. Imagine that a huge market, 30 countries where there will be legal certainty for operators to be able to build out their programs. In. We're also supporting the work around anti-money laundering, which is fascinating. And there's a lot of talk in the press at the moment about the particular direction that that piece of work might go. There is the oncoming work around crypto taxation. The OECD have done some wonderful initial work on that. And we know the European Union are turning their minds towards understanding how taxation 
can be brought into the world of blockchain and crypto. The DLT pilot or the pilot regime, uh, as it was known, PRR, provides a sandbox whereby technologies around blockchain can be applied into traditional uh, finance markets. And that learning journey can be established between uh, the new providers of these wonderful platforms and some of the established players. But it's not just all about finance. Identity plays an important part in our, our, our identity work group is very busy working on EIDAS, and that's a regulatory framework being launched, or in fact, launched by the European Commission to examine the concept of self-sovereign identity, of identity and digital credentials, and try and establish an approach that helps to create some portability, which is so key around identity, whilst also we hope, and we're advocating for this very strongly, to protect the privacy of individuals. And last but not least, the central bank digital currencies, or CBDCs, uh, where there is some considerable place being gathered at the moment. We've done a lot of work on Mika. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but this is just an example of some of the work that we undertake at Inactiva to help uh, create a way in which we can bring a common language between the private sector and the public sector and begin to establish those collaboration opportunities to build sustainable regulatory approaches that we hope will open up massive markets to allow blockchain technologies and solutions to grow at huge scale. There are a lot of other developments that will impact on distributed ledger technologies or blockchain. I've mentioned identity, Joachim referenced data and smart contracts, which is fundamental to some of the building blocks of this wonderful technology and the great projects that are being launched. And last but no means least is the concept of standards and interoperability. If we don't establish technology standards and ensure ways of interoperability between the different solutions, then we do fear it in act, but that silos will be built. And we may just end back up in the situation that Joachim referenced earlier, where the big technology providers, or we end up with a model whereby the big technology providers, as we saw with the internet, are very limited. That could restrict innovation. It could centralize the control and the power in the supply chain. And we could end up where, with a situation where an undue amount of centralization is the unintended consequence of this wonderful opportunity of the blockchain market. So a lot to consider. We invite you to come join us, make your voices heard, take part in our activities and help us educate the public sector about the private sector's views and the private sector about the way in which regulators and governments think about this wonderful market. So with that, I'll stop and pass the floor back. Thank you very much. Vitatos, we don't hear you, sorry. Sorry, thank you, Mark. Thank you for setting the floor once again and uh, for your wonderful insights and uh, some echoes and topics that uh, uh, span across the presentations clearly. And I will be glad to talk about them and discuss in the, in the discussion part, in the panel discussion. And the next, uh, I invite you to come on stage, the next speaker, the next presenter, is uh, Ian Taylor, the executive director of Crypto UK. That is the UK's the trade body that represents the crypto and digital assets industry. Ian, please welcome once again, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you to our hosts at Blockstart. Um, my name is Ian Taylor. I'm the executive director of Crypto UK. My slide should be coming onto screen shortly. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak on this. A very interesting um, panel um, today. Um, this is, will be a fascinating debate, I am sure. I hope I can answer some of the big questions, such as, is regulation in decentralized land an oxymoron? I have a sense that I may leave you with more questions than answers. So let's move to the next slide, please. Just a little bit about um, Crypto UK, the UK's trade body. Uh, we represent um, over 100 companies that operate not just in the UK, but overseas as well, that want to have a presence within the UK jurisdiction. Our main mandate, as you'd expect for a trade association, is to educate, advocate, and work 
with policymakers um, across all the different departments in the UK government um, and also with the private sector to ensure that we deal with the issues on the ground, such as economic crime and consumer harms, but also to really promote the benefits that this new innovative technology can bring to society and industry at large. We also work with other trade associations, such as Mark in Brussels and in Asia and the US to deal with some of the overarching issues that we have internationally um, around the issues that I'll speak about in a moment. Uh, next slide, thank you. Just uh, uh, an idea of our membership here, uh, a few brands that I'm sure you'll recognize. And what we have seen over the last few years with the adoption of crypto assets is initially when we were formed back in 2018, we were quite crypto native heavy in our membership with a, a lot of exchanges or VASPs for the FATF definition virtual asset service providers. But however, we're starting to see an evolution of our membership and we're seeing a significant increase in the amount of members coming to speak to us. We're talking to three to five new members per week, um, and we're seeing more of the traditional finance or um, traditional uh, market players in payments, infrastructure, legal accountancy, wanting to be involved in the community as they decide what products, services they're going to uh, develop that serves the crypto asset ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Just to set the scene in the UK regarding regulation, um, as, as spoken about by the previous two speakers, um, Mika Markets and Crypto Assets uh, will be rolled out very shortly, um, and that's been positively received as I understand it, and has an overarching um, aspect to the industry in what's regulated, whether it be the activity, whether it be the market participant, whether it be market integrity. Whereas the UK has adopted a slightly different approach post Brexit. Now, whatever your view of this is, um, we have to live with this. So in the UK, we've gone for a more piecemeal approach. So there's three core pieces of regulation. Money laundering regime began in the start of 2020. And that obviously was transposed from EU AMLD5 prior to Brexit. This has been running now for over two years. It's looking to conclude at the end of March. It's had a couple of extensions to the applications received back at the beginning um, of this uh, new regime for crypto asset service businesses have, have to perform AML um, and customer due diligence, just like financial institutions, lawyers, estate agents, etc. Where we are today um, is, and the number on your screen, I didn't update, apologies, it's a moving beast. We have over 30 companies that have received um, approvals with over 200 applications received, which was significantly more than the regulator, the FCA in the UK, anticipated. Um, we still have a cohort of some 90 or so companies that do not know whether they will be granted a license, um, and there's six weeks to go. So this is a big problem for companies wanting to do business in the UK. So that's pillar number one. Pillar number two is regarding financial promotions um, and how crypto asset advertising will fall under the current financial promotions order. So all advertising in the UK, specifically for retail, consumers based around crypto asset products and services will have to go through this regime, which in, in its simplest form means there's a gateway where organizations will have to go to an authorized firm and get their promotion signed off. That is in play right now. There's two pieces of uh, this law going, one going through parliamentary scrutiny, which was uh, it's been written by Treasury, and the other, the regulator, the FCA, of which is looking to put crypto assets in a medium risk bucket when it comes to how they can communicate with the mass market. And then the final piece of regulatory clarity today, right now, is in regards to stable coins. Similar to um, the Mika proposal for regulating stable tokens, the UK is adopting an approach where we will see stable coins treated much like e-money. And so there's a whole regulatory regime in the UK that sits under the payments uh, regulatory regime where electric money institutions have to provide a whole suite of um, processes and procedure to protect against consumer harms, for example. And that's how the UK government is looking at stable, stable coin issuers. 
Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. And just a quick note around the taxonomy. How is the UK viewing um, different types of tokens? Well, e-money tokens meet the definition of electronic money, as I suggested before, and you can see stable tokens there will fall into that bucket. Not perfect. When we responded to the public consultation, we, um, as a community, stated that this is only about 80% correct because um, of a central issuer in the, in the case of a private stable coin. Security tokens, not many people in the industry disagree, disagree that security tokens of which represent a real world asset should be regulated similar to traditional securities, so will fall under FISMA or MIFID. And then we have unregulated tokens. So these are your payment tokens or the UK government terms and exchange tokens, so that's Bitcoin. And then utility tokens, such as Ether, which provide a value to um, the user in terms of utility. Um, what can we expect? Now, this is only our view based on discussions we have with policymakers in the UK. Market integrity and market surveillance is something that many people in the government see as a problem um, regarding safeguarding clients' funds. For example, if you, you know, lend or stake your token onto a platform uh, will you get it back will you get it back at the same value so everyone's considering how that should be regulated should we regulate the market participant in regards to this or should we regulate the activity um, and then we also see that quite a lot of the innovative products that exchanges centralized exchanges are providing are crossing over into regulated activities such as collective investment schemes and um, platforms, whether centralized or decentralized, offering access to an underlying traded listed security, um, such as a thin, set, a thin synthetic equity uh, exposure to a traded stock such as Tesla. So that's concerning governments in terms of how organizations are providing security to their consumers. All right, next, uh, next slide. So What's the UK's approach to decentralized apps um, and decentralized organizations? So what's the awareness and understanding at the government level? So we saw in Her Majesty Treasury's consultation um, in March 21, there were two small paragraphs. First, defining DeFi, dApps and smart contracts, and secondly, stating certain activities and tokens could fall into the regulatory perimeter. The UK government not at this does not at this time earlier last year consider bringing DeFi activities into the scope of regulation however they stated they will keep a watchful eye on the developments and ask for the views and risks and benefits on the practicalities of future few potential future regulation considering the decentralized nature and the lack of financial intermediaries within decentralized land um, we at Crypto UK um, are the secretariat for the newly formed all party parliamentary group for crypto assets and digital assets. So we're very pleased to be able to have direct access, access to MPs and peers in the lower and upper house at government, really to start educating, to start discussing with that level of parliament to what's actually happening on the ground. And let's talk about the Law Society. So the UK Law Society, which has statutory authority to reform UK law, is initiate, initiating a project to re reform law for DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. The idea behind the project is that its scope and application will be heavily guided by industry participants, so a good collaboration piece there, which we're heavily involved in, and that its aim will be to facilitate and protect the use of DAOs, particularly their decentralized elements under English law. The project would seek to make English law a competitive tool in the legal DAO landscape whilst recognizing and not looking to change the important idiosyncratic features of DAOs. So now let's talk about HMRC, the UK's tax revenue services. Just a couple of weeks ago, they issued guidance on DeFi lending and staking. This is quite different to most other jurisdictions. I think there's only three or four that are stating that when you dispose, when, when you provide a token to a platform um, such as Aave, um, which is a, a decentralized lending protocol. If I lend my token to that protocol, I expect a passive income in the form of um, a yield. Now, prior to this, um, it was considered much like if I provide my token to a centralized platform, such as Coinbase or Binance, that this will be for tax purposes, um, 
just alone with a, a miscellaneous income coming back in the form of additional tokens. However, this new guidance, which is quite quite lengthy in some 40 pages or so, and it provides a whole suite of activities, is stating that when I lend my token to a platform in decentralized land, a disposal event occurs. Now, let me just set the scene with how the UK tax authority considers um, crypto assets for taxation purposes. It's considered property um, and therefore falls under capital gains tax. They do not consider it currency and they do not consider it a financial security. However, this is new in the sense that prior to this new guidance, which came two weeks ago, um, all a user of a decentralized platform would have to do would be to record and report the additional gains. And then that would fall under capital gains tax. Nobody in industry thinks this is a problem. We all understand that if you receive something additionally, that's income and then would fall under this, this regime that is quite common across the globe. However, this is new in the form that, for example, if I lend to a platform, that's a disposal. A disposal has occurred, so I have to record that. Then, obviously, I expect to get the token back because I have a real expectation that it's still my property and I will get that back just as if I lend my car to my neighbour. I haven't disposed of it. I have a real expectation that's going to come back. And in some cases, I still have control over said token. And then, so that's the one reporting that will take place at the time of providing token to the uh, platform. Then when I get it back after a month or three months, whatever I lock it up for, it could be a day, it could be a second, I would then have to report an acquisition. And then if I get additional in the form of interest or you know, more tokens for, for the APR that's provided on the platform, then that's a third piece of uh, a taxable reporting I have to do. So we believe this is somewhat um, overburdensome on users of DeFi and don't understand where the definition lies between a centralized platform or a decentralized platform. So what we're starting to see, not just with the tax authority, but also with other regulations in the UK and across the piece in other jurisdictions, is outdated regulatory frameworks are hamstringing policymakers and causing frictions in terms of lack of clarity and overburdensome reporting, as I mentioned. So what action can the industry do? Well, right now, we are mobilizing our community to see if there's any way that we can really advocate um, and push for a specific carve out that's focused on crypto assets. Because what we're seeing when it comes to the promotions, when it comes to taxation, when it comes to other aspects of uh, this new innovation, that it's not fitting into the current framework. And for example, in this, uh, the case law quoted in this uh, tax guidance which was released earlier this month, they're referring to a case law in the early 1920s. That's just not fit for purpose in the digital age we live in today. And that, no presentation <laughs> regarding decentralization would be uh, complete without talking about FATF, the Financial Action Task Force. Um, as you folks know, the travel rule has um, been brought into scope for crypto asset service providers um, back in 2019. Earlier last year, in March, additional guidance was issued um, that added to the definition of what is a virtual asset service provider or VASP basically bringing in decentralized operations to that definition. There was somewhat um, of a backlash and major concern from the private sector who mobilized uh, quite well to collaborate and provide a whole suite of private sector input into this open consultation. And what we saw was um, in the updated guidance later in the year, in autumn 2021, FATF stated that it's too soon to start trying to shoehorn uh, decentralized operations into this definition. Definition. So we were pleased to see that um, because we do agree that it's just too too new. Um, we don't know enough about these operations to bring it into the definition of a VASP. And I do believe, and I think Johan quoted some stats from one of the blockchain analysis companies before, that they were a major part of uh, overturning this original suggestion in the fact that they bought some real good analytical quantif quantifiable data to the folks at FATF showing that the use of transactions on a peer-to-peer -peer basis of non-hosted wallets was so insignificant in terms of the monetary value that this wasn't a systemic problem for um, AML and counter-terrorist financing at that time. We're starting to see um, a whole suite of industry solutions. Right now, we have members that are developing travel rule solutions, and these are very interesting around providing a dashboard for um, VASPs 
to send information, messaging standards similar to uh, how SWIFT works in the traditional financial payment system to t for um, platforms to take comfort that the data um, or, or the entity they're dealing with um, is not on a blacklist or not on a sanctions list. However, the industry does have significant privacy concerns and our community in the UK speaks regularly with the guys at Treasury and the illicit finance team for emerging risks around how we're creating perhaps a honeypot of data and the concern is if certain exchanges are compliant, don't have strong procedures around security, resilience, that a whole suite of data is going to be lost into um, nefarious actors and that is a major concern. And just to finish up on this slide, from a global perspective, we're already seeing jurisdictions in Switzerland and Singapore roll out the travel rule. Um, and it's interesting because in Singapore, for example, later this year, users will need to provide the name of the party whom they're transacting with and whether the transaction is being made to a private wallet or an exchange. So we're starting to see non-hosted wallets or non-custodial wallets be brought into the travel rule scope. I'm also hearing that when it comes to determining ownership of private wallets, which is a new interesting development um, in Switzerland, um, that VASP are asking users to submit a screenshot of their wallet, for example, or conducting the so-called Satoshi test, whereby a specific amount of coins is sent to verify wallet to confirm the receipt um, of the tokens in the wallet. Um, an example in Switzerland is Trezor, Trezor a self-hosted wallet, has recently rolled out a protocol that automatically identifies an unhosted wallet when crypt crypto is withdrawn from a Swiss exchange. So as much as when we initially saw that it was complicated to prove ownership of a self-hosted wallet, I've received a handful of these devices over the years from trade shows. How can I prove, you know, providence of self-hosted wallet? We're starting to see real-time solutions where folks are being able to achieve that. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and this is my final slide, uh, somewhat of a short presentation from, from myself. Can the, can the two worlds coexist? And I go back to the um, statement I made at the beginning of my presentation around the oxymoron of regulated decentralized land. Naturally, it's crypto and we're in a whole suite of uh, chat rooms across many different platforms. Um, and many of the uh, let's call them, and I think uh, Yokan mentioned this as well, some aggressive members in, in the community, let's say um, the uh, you know people that have the philosophy that uh, we don't trust centralized entities and we now have the opportunity to live outside of this this world. Is that re is that practical? Can, you know, what is the definition of a fully decentral um, organization? Is is Bitcoin? the most decentralized um, blockchain out there, probably. And we hear this a lot with these um, uh, protagonists uh, that I mentioned previously, you know, code is law. Well, what does that actually mean versus the rule of law? Well, here's a good example. A DeFi protocol was attacked um, where weaknesses in a liquidity pool were exploited and $16 million in funds were drained by, drained by a young software engineer who we know is based in Canada. He was outed by the platform. Um, this in itself is unusual or doxxed in crypto speak. This chap allegedly used flash loans to drain funds from indexed finance, which is a decentralized finance protocol offering index fund style structured products. Following an investigation from industry experts, the affected team managed to uncover uh, this uh, chap's identity. Um, and subsequently, a warrant has been issued for a court appearance in Canada. This young engineer continues to pr protest his innocence, saying no crime was committed, um, saying that he just exploited weaknesses in, in the exchange. Well, here lies an interesting question. So what do we want here? Um, an analogy that I like to think about is, okay, so I walk into a bank, the security cameras are switched off, the bank vault is open, I walk into the vault and I pick up a bar of gold and walk out. Does a crime occur there? Did I just exploit weaknesses in the security? Well, I think if it gets to court and we're starting to see these first use cases come to court and we'll get to see some test cases proven that a judge will probably not agree with the young software engineer that he was exploiting weaknesses in this protocol. 
Furthermore, we're also seeing DEXs start to come in to the regulatory perimeter. So we talked to a number of exchanges across all of the layer one protocols that are developing um, AML um, and KYC automated solutions for their users. And we know that there's a focus at that intergovernmental level within um, NFT platforms that are currently doing no customer due diligence or a number of DeFi platforms that, that currently are. But there are some that are starting to consider this. And also, interestingly, it does seem that a lot of decentralized platforms consider taxation as the last um, piece of focus and are more focused on securities law. We are starting to see a number of decentralized protocols approach the big four accountancy firms for taxation advice. And the question here is how, how do these highly regulated entities that are talking to these market participants take comfort in onboarding them as a client through their own uh, customer due diligence? What's the source of funds? Who are the backers? We don't even know who the, um, the people are behind the scenes of this organization. SushiSwap, for example, you know, the founder is completely pseudonymous, but however, we do know some of the developers, but where are they based? What's the nexus? And so these are the interesting discussions that are having right now. And then final point here to wrap up uh, my presentation is decentralized regulatory arbitrage. And by this, I mean, if I refer to HMRC's guidance that was issued earlier, um, if, if I'm a decentralized platform in the true sense of it, you know, I use our example because they're a lending protocol for the definition of HMRC. They could argue to protect against their retail users or, you know, their, their, their consumers using their platform, having this new overburdensome, in my view, um, uh, requirement for reporting for tax purposes. Um, they could argue that they're centralized for tax purposes in the fact that we know who the founder is, we know who the development team is, we know who the general counsel is, they have a legal structure. Um, Whereas when it comes to FATF, let's go back to the region of guidance in March, where the um, definition of FAS started to bring in decentralized platforms such as Arvid, they could argue in terms of you know, customer due diligence, we are decentralized because we have um, a community of users. We have a DAO that runs the functioning of our um, community and makes the, the decisions. There's no centralized entity deciding on the process procedure and strategy of this organization so that's going to be an interesting development of how that plays out so thank you very much um, i'll hand back to our host look forward to the panel discussion thank you ian thank you so much it was really interesting to hear a perspective unfortunately from outside of the eu um, but uh, nevertheless there are things to learn uh, from both sides and now I'm uh, going. Uh, we're going to zoom in a little bit uh, with two more presentations uh, before our panel discussion, and uh, those two presentations uh, will, and our dear uh, presenters will dig deeper into how we can actually uh, enable bottom-up uh, regulation and uh, share some ideas around uh, uh, decentralized decision making. I invite to the scene, to the stage, uh, Gilles Mentre, co-founder and president of Alexis. Please, uh, Gilles, the floor is yours. Looking forward to look uh, here and see your presentation. Please unmute yourself and share your presentation. Is it okay? Yes. Yes, thank you very much uh, without us. Uh, and thank you for you know uh, inviting me to this uh, this high level panel. Um, as you were saying, um, you know this is maybe um, I think my speech will be a zoom in. Uh, you know I don't have any of the skills of the previous speakers to talk about the general picture on blockchain regulation in Europe. I must admit that I learned myself a lot, and I look forward to um, joining some of the initiatives that were just uh, mentioned. Uh, on my side, I'm a co-founder um, and, and president of uh, a non-profit uh, NGO called Electis. And what we do is electronic voting uh, based on the blockchain. So I have prepared, prepared a small presentation. I don't know um, if I'm supposed to share it or if it's going to be shared 
by the host. share it. Or, yeah. I think that here it is. Very good. Maybe we can put it in slides. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so we um, we talked a lot about uh, different uh, business application of, uh, of of blockchain and how much it's uh, of course uh, disrupting, decentralizing, and 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 uh, um, and, and reinventing uh, many businesses um, in, in in the industry in Europe and, and outside. Uh, the focus we're going to have here is very particularly on something which is not directly business. Um, it shouldn't, you know, it's not in the business world. Um, uh, and I will talk a bit later about how, you know, also uh, private, public or non-profit actors can interact there. But this is the, the general theme of governance and, and public voting. Uh, E-voting, electronic voting has been uh, around for um, a very long while. Um, and some states, uh, some member states, have actually been using it uh, actively. I'm of course thinking about Estonia, which, uh, which is a country which is uh, voting electronically for 15 years now, as most of people probably know around the table. What we got really interested in when we created Electis is how much blockchain and decentralization can bring a totally new light uh, on electronic voting. Our perspective is, um, that the question of trust is, of course, the key question when you are talking about electronic voting and about governance. And when you're talking about trust, there's always a question of the objective trust and what we could call the subjective trust. The objective trust is all the requirement in terms of security, confidentiality, verifiability that any system should have. And of course, the subjective trust, which is how much citizen will trust an, uh, an e-voting system, is fed by these objective elements but it's also fed by, I would say, a more, much more behavioral approach. When we look about paper voting, ballot voting, uh, which of course is, is still the main role in most of the uh, EU member states, it's been a very long process. It was, you know, to 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 be accepted. Now it reaches very high level of of, uh, of trust and confidence, at least in Europe. And again. Uh, uh, this is not a 100% secure system, as some other countries in the world have proved us. But nevertheless, it brings trust because it's it in itself very decentralized. It's decentralized by each, of course, of the um, of the polling station. It's decentralized by all the verifi verifiers. In every election, you would have different assessors or scrutators, uh, which are from different parties, which are from um, uh, voluntary uh, citizens, and in a way. This is a transitive trust. Citizens, each of us, trust the result because we trust the people who are uh, looking after it and we trust the decentralized aspect of it. What blockchain is bringing into that, uh, that sphere is a totally new perspective where we can achieve some stage of decentralization, which, which could be, um, which is a proxy, which make it look more like the, the decentralized trust we have in ballot voting. Just to focus one second and to, to tell you, you know, who, who we are and what we what we're doing. So, Electis, we decided to create Electis as a nonprofit to investigate that sphere of how can we bro bring blockchain voting or at least some usage of the blockchain in the e-voting system to uh, to 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 enhance the current system. What we have done is developed an end-to-end verifiable and totally open-source system. We are funded by the Tezos Foundation for total disclosure. Tezos Foundation, Tezos is a blockchain uh, that uh, probably many of, of you around the table know very well. Uh, and we've been working, you know, here are some of the partners uh, we've been working with. In particular, we're mentioning Microsoft. This is not the, 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 the you know, the, of course, the, the for-profit part, the company. Microsoft has a department which is entirely working on open source. Uh, which is the democracy department, and they coded an SDK, which is again open source. It's uh, probably sufficient, sufficiently rare in Microsoft history to to mention it, you know, which is called Election Guard. And we've been not only working with this SDK, but also with the team, uh, which have an, an amazing expertise on all these uh, subjects. Uh, but again, also many uh, universities 
across uh, the EU and beyond in the US. And today we're already starting to organize, you know, 15 official elections and 20,000 voters. Next slide, please. Um, and this is where I want to zoom in a little bit about the blockchain. Um, again, you know, there's uh, in every uh, e-voting um, uh, uh, architecture and, 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 and solution, there is, of course, a big conflict between the openness and the decentralization and the recounting and the confidentiality. How can we ensure that at uh, the same time we can have a full tracking of the recount, the tally of the of the bulletin, of your own individual bulletin, and at the same time ensure confidentiality. And this is a little bit the you know the uh, the, the, the the squabble that uh, um, a lot of people have been working on for now. I would say ten to five years, five to ten years, uh, and that's we're we're trying to implement through the election guard slash Tezos protocol. So using an algorithm of confidentiality, of encryption, which allows for confidentiality of the bulletin. So we cannot decipher any bulletin individually, only the sum of the bulletin. But at the same time, uh, we can make a tracking where everyone can ensure that his or her ballot are there at the right level. This is very important because that's where we get, thanks to the blockchain, the same level of decentralization as the ballot voting. In our elections, we have what we call e-scrutators. An e-scrutator is someone that can do two verification. It can verify his or her voting at the same uh, content than the one he voted. And it is through what we call the hash function. I don't want to be too technical. It's like the digital print of their voting. They know it. They are the only one to know it. And they can verify it's there in on the blockchain at the end or on the distributed ledger that uh, is linked, uh, that which um, uh, IRL is on the blockchain. And also verify that the tally is correct because the hash of the entire artifact of the election are the same uh, than the one uh, which are on the, on, the, on the blockchain. The second aspect of the blockchain, which is very interesting, and I want to, to, to focus on here, is of course around the smart contract. Another very important aspect of trust or maybe distrust around the election is how are the organizer of the election linked to the result? Of course, when we're talking about sovereign elections, uh, legal elections, there is a legal framework to ensure it. Nevertheless, uh, around delays, around uh, ability to, to, to implement the result. And then if we go down uh, on, on more, let's say, open consultations, uh, which is the kind of every, everyday life of uh, modern uh, democracies, how can we ensure that the result is going to be uh, implemented? And this is where the smart contract plays an important role, because we can automate some of the consequences of the election. At the moment, and this is I'm already anticipating much beyond what we can actually do today, but to open some doors on how elections might look like in five or ten years. Today, we are automating, you know, the legal aspect of the of the result. Uh, once the tally is done. You can see all the results. You can see all the artifacts and the legal aspect of the vote being published on the blockchain, which is a first level of trust. But one can imagine that in the future, you would have some automated consequences in terms of spending, in terms of uh, decision making, as long as, of course, we remain on chain, that would be applied there. Next slide, please. This is a little bit, and I don't want to go into the electricity app, just to tell you that the blockchain. And this is how you know it's interesting to think about it. Uh, a, a lot of time we're talking about businesses which are entirely on the blockchain or not entirely on the blockchain. E-voting has a lot to learn from using the blockchain, but not, of course, voting everything on the blockchain. And I'll be happy if there's a discussion after to go more in the details. Next slide, please. So here are some of the uh, usage that we're already seeing around uh, this decentralized uh, governance. Uh, we at Electis are working with very different types of actors. We started from the beginning to work with the UN. Um, and all of this, all of these four uh, verticals have in common is we are, you know, our, our, our view is not to replace uh, sovereign voting where it already exists. And I'm referring to uh, 
Joachim uh, uh, presentation at the beginning of the of the conference. Um, in every aspect, it's what was what is true for business is true for governance. In in, in voting, you also have the kind of the ancient world, uh, very centralized, very ring fenced, uh, with a few actors. Okay, this is our sovereign voting, uh, which has its own rules, which is a party uh, a party based voting. And what we are seeing is there is another world which is opening, which has a lot of actors who are trying to get the same kind of, who are trying to use votes uh, to legitimate and to bring more democracy in their own processes, in a kind of more horizontal way of, uh, of governance. And this, of course, is an empty space where a lot of disruption is, is happening. This goes from international organizations. So we're working for the UN. Everyone sees the result of the COP26. You know, the governments decide how can you bring more legitimacy to the observers or the other parties around the table? What we did is we organized for Yongo, which is the youth constituency of the UNFCCC, the possibility to elect their representative, their representative to the COP27. So they will come at the COP27 with an increased legitimacy, which will make their voice, of course, more heard than uh, just being appointed or self-selected. Um, self, uh, Same for migrants and refugees, people who are deprived from the right to vote. What we are engaged in a process in Switzerland with Baloti, with some uh, with uh, you know some voluntary cities, uh, the main one being Zurich, to help migrants, refugees to 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 have um, to to start to learn democracy by voting on specific issues uh, again through uh, through uh, e-voting. Universities, of course, and this is a mix of research slash governance project, and we run elections in many universities which are helping us on the development and international NGOs and associations. Next slide, please. But at the same time, what we see is a lot of interest from where democracy really stems from, which is the public sphere itself. And we're getting very involved in different cities uh, in Europe. Again, not to replace official voting. Uh, we're uh, um, where we see there is a lot of new energy is from all the new democratic uh, times, um, 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 uh, occasions which are emerging uh, by some mayors or some political leaders that do believe that there is room for increased consultation or increased democracy where they stand. Uh, we are started to, you know, to, to work in partnership with, with cities uh, in France, I'm mentioning the uh, sur Seine, where we do regular elections, where the mayor is trying to 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 have um, a, a dynamic approach of 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 the e-voting with citizens on monthly consultations. Vicom Bigorre, where we're doing this weekend a very political election, where the mayor is going to make his his um, uh, citizen decide who he's going to support for the presidential election. So, saying I have no mandate from my election to do such a political move, or Zurich, which I just mentioned, uh, for, for the refugee uh, voting. Next slide, please. And, and this is where it's very important. Where we're starting, you know, and, and, and again, that's uh, aligned with your implementation. This is where blockchain is bringing, I would say, uh, a new energy to a very, very um, um, established and, and old system. Uh, we're starting from very simple e-voting participation in cities. And of course, what we are looking at is a, a fully e-democratic city where consultation, thanks to uh, the trust that uh, the citizen will have in the tools, would be something of a daily practice where uh, um, uh, you know, uh, a mayor will uh, always turn to its citizen for everything which he believes he doesn't have the legitimacy for its own election. And probably a model, uh, and I, I know the, the, the mayor of Neuilly, who is the first one who worked with, with us, like to say, I've been elected on very clear priorities. On these priorities, I have a mandate, and I don't need to turn back to my citizen to, to confirm it. But life is what happened when you had other plans, as, 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 as John Lennon famously said, Everything happens in the middle. Uh, what is your legitimacy as a mayor tomorrow, as a head of a region, and probably tomorrow as a government in a in a country to actually implement some of the decision? 
Next slide, please. I just wanted to conclude uh, here. Um, again, I realize I'm giving you a very zoom in on, on a particular aspect. I, I haven't touched about the, the legislative aspect of, of it. Um, apart from Estonia, there is absolutely no framework in the EU member state for e-voting, um, apart from some exceptions. I would mention, for example, in France, uh, uh, remote e-voting is in place for overseas uh, citizens, which is something that I think most of the EU member states also have discussions about. Um, for the sovereign voting, and this is not an EU competence, there's a long way, I would believe, before remote e-voting actually comes into place. The question is, how do we fill the empty space in between, okay? Uh, in between this uh, very uh, sovereign um, uh, and official uh, elections, there's a lot of room for new democratic um, uh, moments, new democratic consultations. Um, for the moment, there is a total legal vacuum. Uh, I know it's the case in France, I know it's the case in, in Germany, um, and um, we haven't, you know, we're, we're mostly active in France, Germany, uh, Switzerland. I'm not sure about other EU member states. I presume it's the same. Uh, as as Joachim was saying at the beginning, uh, you know, regulation would probably follow rather than anticipate it. What we're saying is already people starting to use that kind of tools uh, to organize elections within mayor, uh, municipalities and, and public entities or outside it in NGOs, in, in youth movements, in, uh, in, in political movements. This will happen whether we like it or not. I believe the regulation will steadily follow and make it a complementary tool to the existing uh, sovereign instrument. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gilles. Thank you for this zooming in and uh, decision making, uh, enabling enabling the, the grassroots and, and bottom up to uh, to voice their uh, their opinion and have in a direct influence. And the last presentation before we go to the panel discussion comes from Peter Nobles. He's a co-owner at uh, Vitality and uh, Calippo. Peter, please come on stage and tell us more about uh, uh, regulation uh, for DAO and also how this can be used in a broader, uh, broader uh, spectrum as well. Well, thank you, Vatitas, for uh, your introduction and the other speakers as well for your wonderful presentations. Uh, so I uh, shall share my screen. Uh, we had, did a rehearsal, so this should work. Yes, can you see my screen? Just a check. Not yet. Not yet. How is that possible? I go back to the uh, Zoom environment. Uh, share screen. Uh, share. I hope this is better. Yes. Can you confirm, please? Okay, thank you. Okay, well, again, uh, my name is Peter Nobles. Uh, this presentation uh, will be uh, about DAOs, uh, one type of blockchain applications. Uh, my presentation will uh, comprehend three parts. Uh, the first is a short introduction to DAOs. The, the second part is about uh, DAO self-regulation. And the third part will be about the connection between uh, DAOs and uh, existing jurisdictions. So this is a really bottom-up approach. Uh, yeah, well, some uh, initiatives I'm involved in. Uh, Calippo, it's a platform on which uh, uh, communities, as we say, can establish their DAO. Uh, I'm involved in the DAO Hub, a group of experts. Uh, we are building on LISC, uh, a blockchain infrastructure. And I'm also a lecturer at the University of Applied Science in Utrecht. So that's enough for now. And well, this is the short introduction, uh, as, as the, the, the name suggests, uh, decentralized autonomous organizations. But what does that mean? Uh, DAOs are decentralized because they run on an infrastructure uh, which is uh, based on nodes, uh, computers all, perhaps all over the world, which run the code. But they are also decentralized because, because their members don't have to be in the same building. They can also be uh, citizens who live all over the world. 
Well, and DAOs are autonomous because uh, in their protocol, uh, the protocol run, runs autonomously. If this, then that, uh, when there is a trigger, the protocol will run unstoppable according to the software as specified. And we also call this uh, censorship resistant because no one can stop the code or change the code single-handedly. And also the layers are, um, are, are um, safe from uh, tempering. And the last part, uh, organizing DAOs are all about supporting uh, communities in their governance and in their coordination. So these DAOs, are, are, they do run on top of a blockchain infrastructure like Ethereum, well known. And we, uh, as Calippo, we built on LISC. So DAOs are for the community and by the community. Uh, let's uh, dive a little bit uh, deeper. Um, and what are DAOs not? Uh, the members are not always known by, uh, they don't, don't always know each other. And there's no management team. There's no CEO doing the calls. There's no uh, office building, uh, just to name a few attributes. Uh, and now what are they? Uh, they have account holders uh, known by their public key. Uh, they are member managed. Uh, the members, they decide uh, the course of the DAO. And they have a FED protocol, as we call it. They put as much uh, uh, decision making and rules in their code. And often, uh, especially now, they are web native, as we call it. So they don't have a building, but they work together and live together on the web just to name a few attributes of DAOs. Um, and let's a little bit zoom in on the FET protocol. Huh? When you build a protocol for a DAO, you can put a lot of rules in it. So what kind of rules do we distinguish? Uh, at Calippo, we say we have procedural or organizational constructs, uh, procedural like a workflow or organizational constructs like roles. But you can also put in your FED protocol legal construct or tax construct. And th those are the things I'm going to dive into in this uh, presentation. Okay, a little bit more on DAOs and the members. Who are the members? Uh, we, we often don't know. We only know, so the non pseudonymous, uh, the public keys. And those uh, participants or those members have their accounts. And hopefully in those accounts, they have some tokens. Okay, what are the elements of a DAO? Uh, at Calippo, we call this the constitution, uh, the set of rules, uh, the, the rules of the game we want to play by. The DAO itself also has a treasury. Uh, and then we have the membership reg register, registration or administration and the transaction log, uh, which keeps track of all the transaction done, let's say voting or a value, value transfer. A DAO also has his own public key. So these are some basic elements uh, a DAO has. Okay, and how does it work in principle? Uh, what do, uh, does uh, member management looks like? Uh, the, the members, uh, they can vote, uh, perhaps on a new constitution, uh, on new rules of the game. They can also uh, vote on value transfers. Uh, are we willing to transfer some money uh, to, to some contractor, for example? And they even can vote on uh, memberships. Uh, when you have a private DAO uh, where members should be voted in, uh, the members, the current members, can uh, make their calls, make their vote. And everything registered in the transaction log. So this is a real democracy. There's no worldwide definition of DAOs. And what, what actually are they? It's not so easy to grab. Is it just a community of account holders? Is it a protocol, just software? Is it an actor? Eh? If this, then that, it will execute for the community. For this presentation, I will zoom in on a DAO as a digital nation state. And when you imagine a DAO as a digital nation state, you also begin to think, can it be a jurisdiction of its own? And that's the topic of today. And let's start with uh, the, the physical nation states. Uh, I just uh, picked three. Uh, I live in the Netherlands, this is for one, and one in Hong Kong and Estonia as an example of a highly digitized uh, uh, country. And then we have DAOs. 
So residents of all these countries can become a member of the DAO. Uh, and on the DAO, they only are known by their public keys. So, so we don't even know uh, in which, which country they live. Okay, let's elaborate a little bit more. Let's take the platform perspective. Uh, most platforms uh, can raise more than one DAO. So the, what you see here is three DAOs and one DAO with, with its members. And let, let's add one element to it. A DAO governing the platform overall. So on with, with these elements in mind, I want to elaborate a little bit on how you can uh, implement, uh, especially law, cons uh, law constructs or a tax construct in such a digital nation state. Uh, let's imagine that there's no outside world and you want to raise a whole new country yourself. And if you um, uh, take such a stance, take such a point of view, then you can ask yourself the question, what legal issues or challenges should you tackle uh, to make this digital nation state uh, a safe place to do, to, to do transactions, excuse me, uh, to prevent malicious behavior, to provide justice, to enforce justice, and to define general rules, and define a governance structure for the platform overall and for the member DAOs. So at Calippo, these were the questions we asked ourselves, and we said, well, we can um, invent everything by ourselves, or we can lend, we can look at current uh, regular uh, jurisdictions. And for hundreds of years, people have thought about uh, what should we do to protect people and to punish misbehavior. <coughs> and from that uh, came, <coughs> excuse me, came a lot of uh, uh, sub laws. And we said, well, why don't we learn from this law and just digitize the current version uh, and make a digitized digital version on our platform? And we find out some laws were applicable and some, some laws weren't applicable. And once uh, we started to digitize current uh, legal constructs, uh, we can say, okay, when that's not enough for us, we can perhaps enhance those current digital uh, constructs or make them better because our digital environment uh, has the uh, possibilities to do so. Okay, now let's me, give me you some examples uh, uh, of what we are building on at Calippo. Uh, the first is uh, when you're on board on the platform, you have to accept the constitution uh, during onboarding. Um, and that's the first step in uh, accepting, uh, like you accept the terms and conditions on, on every platform, but accepting the rules of the game uh, on the platform you are, you are uh, uh, participating in. And the next thing uh, we said, okay, uh, it's also up to the participants to vote on the, uh, the, the DAO governing uh, the DAO governing the platform. So you don't only have the ability to vote in your within your own DAO, but you also have the possibility to vote on the platform overall, uh, also on the constitution, uh, uh, perhaps treasury issues or memberships. Uh, second thing uh, th that we implemented, um, the, the constitution of the platform is always leading. So you can you have your own rules on the DAO uh, level, but uh, when there is a conflict, the, 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 the constitution uh, of the platform will always be, uh, be leading. So this is another thing, eh? and, and another uh, law uh, construct we implemented, that we are implementing on our platform, and we call it a uh, contract composure. And where two uh, DAOs want to do a transaction together, they can put up uh, or drafting a contract. And when you push on the button uh, on Calippo, a template contract will appear. And that contract will have a standard provision stemming from the constitution of the platform. So you can't make a, 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 a contract which has conflicts with the overall um, uh, constitution. You just have to fill in the variables and then you have a legal way of uh, doing business together. 
Here's another example what we're working on. And let's say you have a dispute between DAO 2 and DAO 3, and yeah, you have a need for mediation. And uh, what we are implementing right now is that the two DAOs uh, uh, pay some of their tokens uh, in an account, and they can hire a skilled or uh, experienced mediator to solve their dispute. And when the dispute handling eh, on the level of mediation doesn't work, eh, bring you the, the result you want, uh, we uh, are working on the second level, and we call, call this arbitrage with a committee and members of other DAOs on the platform. And in this case, we plan to pay it from the treasury, eh, like uh, the tax treasury, um, which pays the members eh, and do their verdict, so to say. And when you enter as a DAO, you establish a DAO on the platform, you accept that the arbitrage verdict will be final. So you have to act on it as a DAO. So this is the second level of dispute handling, just to give you some impression how you can implement another legal construct on a digital, uh, in a digital nation state. And here's the last one. This is more from the text, uh, the text construct. You can say uh, very simple. Whenever you do a transaction on our platform, a little bit of the fee you pay each other, of you have to pay to the platform, and it ends up in the treasury uh, of the overall platform. And so the usage of the platform, uh, like on every platform uh, these days, you have to pay a little bit fee to the software. And uh, in this case, it, it ends up in the treasury, uh, which will be part of overall uh, voting again, uh, how to spend it. Um, so that, that was the second part. And now we had the issue, let's say you have an almost perfect digital nation state, and how can you connect it to regular uh, jurisdictions? And you can approach from two ways. Hey, what do you ask for to be supported, but also what uh, is demanded from the outside world for uh, the platform? So this picture represents that two questions. And just to give you some wild ideas, I, I uh, yeah, offer you some uh, pictures with, with new, uh, new ideas how, uh, about taxation. And you can say we don't uh, tax uh, DAOs at all. Uh, we put only taxation on residents. We know where you, where you live. And if you earn something, you have to pay. So you pay as a resident, but you don't uh, have a taxation on DAOs. Here's a second idea. Uh, why, don't, uh, why don't we raise or establish one global tax office uh, who collects uh, taxation of taxes from all different DAOs and distribute it to all the, uh, the member states? In this uh, case, uh, these are real countries. A third idea. Uh, why don't you become, as a, as a nation, uh, a member in each DAO? So you can uh, you have a say in the constitution, but you can also benefit uh, from, 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 from the value which DAO make. And the last one, uh, why don't you become as a nation state a DAO yourself? Uh, your residents are members of your DAO, but as a government, you are a member of a DAO also. So then you have a DAO Netherlands, a DAO Hong Kong, and a DAO Estonia with, 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 uh, excuse me, with exclusive memberships. And so only residents of a certain country can participate in the DAO of their country. So just, this was just uh, the, 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 the third part, uh, as, uh, some wild ideas to build upon. And uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, Vatitas, I uh, give it back to you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thanks to all the presenters so far. And now, uh, in a quick while, we're going to jump to a panel discussion. But before that, I would uh, like uh, to present the results of our uh, poll. We wanted to know uh, very quickly, just for the curiosity's sake, we wanted to know and we asked you to, uh, on Slido, to uh, reply in response to what uh, organization you present out of the 
uh, around 90 participants uh, up and down. So it's not, uh, it's not surprising that the majority come from startups or SMEs, quite a few from academia, uh, also investors are very, very glad to see them. General public is, uh, is also very active. Uh, so these were the results. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, and I remind you that uh, on slido.com slash blog start, you can ask questions. Uh, ask questions during the panel discussion. Uh, we already have some questions and uh, we will uh, do our best to, to raise at least a few of them uh, if the time provides. Um, and uh, on Zoom, maybe, if, again, if we will have time, uh, within the last minutes, uh, we we will try to have an opportunity to to ask a question uh, live. So if you want to do that, uh, if you want to voice your question, please raise your hand. There's a raise hand uh, function at the bottom of the screen. So with the, without further ado, uh, we're going to the discussion phase, and uh, you have seen the five speakers before, and now I want to introduce the sixth participant. Uh, Agatha Ferreira. She's the chief legal officer at um, Status uh, IM. She, she, as I said, she also has uh, quite a few other uh, other titles as an expert at the EU Blockchain Observatory and Forum, and also as an advisor for Blockchain for Europe. Uh, Agatha, welcome. And uh, actually, I would uh, like uh, all participants of the panel discussion to open up their videos. And uh, I will start uh, with you, Agatha. I will try to set the stage for the discussion and, uh, and then for the warm up. And I will ask, pass this question on to the other participants as well. Uh, and the question is, why, why are we ta even talking about decentralized regulation? Uh, in this case, is it just because uh, the, the technology or the, or the solutions based on the, blockchain are decentralized or because uh, some other reasons, I don't know, uh, because it's so difficult to regulate uh, or, or this, this technology is so modern that uh, the top-down approaches don't work uh, or any other reasons. Why is that? Can you please share your thoughts? Thank you very much for giving me the microphone first um, and welcome everybody. And uh, it was fascinating to listen to all the presentations. Uh, I, I really hope to watch it back again because uh, it was really very interesting. Jan, your uh, your you know breakdown of all the initiatives and Peter, your you present. I mean, all of them were really very very interesting. And uh, and partly the, the answer to your question is probably because you know look look at where we are and what we do we are discussing this topic which means there is a there is an urgency and need to discuss and evaluate and uh, and understand so this uh, this technology really disrupts uh, the conceptual legal and uh, regulatory frames and this is not only as a matter of um, of a degree to which they disrupt is a matter of, of a principle. Uh, they disrupt the conceptual frames as a matter of principle. And um, there, are, there are reasons for that really, uh, but um, there, the rise of this technology, uh, the speed of this innovation and the character of this innovation really puts the regulators to a very, very tough test of competency. Uh, and uh, very often, um, and what we observe is a catch-up strategy often and reactionary stance. And uh, um, regulators are really playing this catch-up strategy very often to the phenomena that grows, grow so quickly. But at the same time, I think it's very important to understand that this, uh, this phenomenon um, creates unique opportunities for us and hopefully we uh, take advantage of this opportunity even discussing this today to um, to reassess really to reassess our societal and institutional design to understand what is this technology exposing uh, what sort of deficiencies in existing frameworks in existing uh, regulatory approaches what does it uh, what does it expose uh, whether the existing regulator and legal frameworks um, are even compatible with the with uh, the constructs of this technology itself, 
Uh, so I think we have this very unique opportunity to reassess how we approach, uh, you know, how we approach this technology and to this normative, um, dominant normative uh, stance should be to reassess all this um, rising technology for public uh, for public good and for public interest as a as a as a mechanism and tool for social progress so um, i think this is why we are here and the reason why we are discussing is that because um, this technology is really putting um, a lot of question marks on how we define how we classify certain concepts how we define uh, participants what sort of roles and responsibility we assign we assign in this very decentralized world where the traditional uh, traditional roles, traditional intermediaries don't exist. So uh, this is one of the reasons. The, the, the other reason why we discuss this is because this technology is uh, inherently cross-border, inherently uh, disregards political and geographical borders and jurisdictional borders. And I mean that not only in the sense of political borders and geographical borders, but also jurisdictional borders between the agencies that are called upon to regulate this technology because we've we've heard this, this goes into taxation this goes into uh, a lot of civil law concepts this goes into uh, financial uh, financial uh, sphere so i think there is um, this 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 is a paradigm shift uh, really it is a paradigm shift and uh, this to achieve a coherent regulatory strategy we need a lot of deeper and broader understanding of how this regulate how this technology challenges the core principles and the operative uh, operational logic of established order but also calls for a lot of uh, cooperation across the agencies across jurisdictions uh, across different regulatory um, and supervisory bodies thank you agata uh, thank you and um, uh, Thank you for the intro and warming up our discussion. Uh, I will not, we will not have time to give every, uh, each of you to a response to this one. But uh, if someone uh, wants to add um, something to the response to my question about why do we need to talk about decentralized and bottom-up regulation of blockchain, please, uh, uh, please uh, raise your hand, raise your voice, and mute yourself, and uh, we're listening to your answer. I see Mark is unmuting. Yes, Mark, please. Thank you, Vitesa. So let me give you a, a provocative thought uh, as to why we need to talk about it. Imagine a scenario at some point in the future where there are a couple of billion individuals in a digital land uh, that doesn't have a natural geographical boundary where those participants are not naturally residents of a particular country, jurisdiction or state, but to whom uh, a project drops an amount of value in the form of tokens that suddenly starts to represent a significant amount of the disposable income or disposable value that those individuals have in the real world. And if you can think forwards uh, you know, to this vision of the future that I'm projecting now, just to be a little provocative, um, I wonder if the audience and if the panelists think that that would represent a risk or an opportunity to the traditional world. And I put that forward as a, a suggestion, in part to answer your question, to be deliberately provocative as to perhaps one of the reasons why we need to engage in a discussion at this point in time. Okay. Uh, Ian, please, uh, your thoughts. Thank yeah, you good Mark. start off at 10, Mark. Thank you for the provocative question. And I can answer that in some point in terms of what, what I see personally as an active user in the DeFi community. So over the last two years, there's been so much capital flowing in to blockchain. People have been building. People have been building the infrastructure, new chains, new bridges between chains. Um, and we know Ethereum has the most tooling right now, but it's hamstrung by the costs to transact um, and by the settlement time, TPS, <clears throat> transaction per second. So what we see today is 
the development in pay to play gaming, right? And there is a platform called Axie Infinity that is a really interesting use case today. These guys built this um, online game out of Thailand, I believe. And in the Philippines um, and other areas of Indonesia, there's folks that are earning pennies um, compared to Western worlds. And they're playing this particular game and others like it um, on blockchain technology, um, earning salaries 10 times what the average um, salaries are in these developing countries. And I've even heard that the, some of these countries are looking at this and thinking we should be taxing this. Um, however, how do you enforce that? And again, I come back to what HMRC have done. How do they enforce on a decentralized platform um, in terms of reporting? So it's very interesting. Stuff is happening now. Tooling is being built to provide for high transactions per second at low cost within the gaming space. And the infrastructure is here today, just like in the past, we didn't have the infrastructure to transmit data down old copper wires. We do now with fiber optic rolled out across the Western worlds. Um, protocols are developing like TCIP and other email standards. This year is going to be very interesting regarding the development around that space. Thank you, Ian. Joachim, uh, please, your thoughts. Yes, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the other panelists because I found that all very pertinent and very thoughtful uh, contributions. And I especially like the combination. On the one hand side, we have these very thoughtful, elaborate uh, comments from Mark and Ian on the other hand side. And that is extremely important. We have the practical world examples from, from Gilles and Peter to see how it actually works. And I'm fully convinced that it works. So I think it's an excellent mixture. I would take up of what Mark said and even go further. What the technology does, what the digital space does, it gives our identity back to us. And this is extremely important because we are born into a context where I think most of us take that for granted, more or less need to accept it for practical reasons, but do not necessarily feel comfortable with it. And that's actually a very pro provocative question. I ask my, my, my friends at times, and then they are quite often shocked to say that actually, where do you see you in your life? Disregarding geographical borders, disregarding also time borders, what is your identity? What is a community that you would like to engage with? And that is not normally the community that you are born in. I give you a very personal example and I'm not making any political messages here. My country, Germany, where I come from was completely changed about 80 years ago. So for, for reasons we all know very much. And basically there was an American system put on top of us, which I as, as a person reject for me privately, because uh, a lot of our histories, a lot of our traditions were deleted and suddenly we have a different time frame. I myself, I am a Prussian, not a Russian that's important today. I am a Prussian from Prussia. So basically uh, I'm a monarchist. I'm living in, in different centuries. I would say my value set is different. Now, you have two choices in the traditional world. Either you just forget all about that and for practical reasons live in the state that you were born in, or you go to some gaming or playing space or you do other things in the German Democratic Republic. For example, in the East, there were tens of thousands of Indians running around. So they were replicating what, what Winnetou and Karl May in his stories and so were doing in order to escape from reality. This technology transforms us much more deeply. It allows us to actually, as Peter has explained, create communities, nearly states or states as such in a digital form, borderless communities where people are allowed to live according to their values. And I respect all sorts of values. I have no personal opinion of what is good or bad. This is not about normative. Everyone can really transform a big part of their identity in these virtual spaces and they start interacting. And then it indeed comes to this question of what about financial resources then? If a big part of our income would be tokenized, created there, if we start trading, if we start giving us our own rules in this space, of course it has repercussions with the real world. And this is something that my personal experience is appeals to many, many people because they suddenly feel empowered by the opportunities. They see the richness of all of this. They see the opportunities. They see that, okay, I might have a job, a bad paid job, two or three jobs, not a job at all. I'm living in this situation. I do not really want to escape only in a fictitious world, but suddenly I can shape the situation much better than I have been able in the past. And of course, that immediately raises all the questions about governance about regulation, 
And we know from history, I'm an economic historian by trade, I know history well, uh, that if you have formal institutions and then the informal institutions, what people do in their everyday life changes and they are not compatible any longer, the informal institutions will win. That has always been the case. And there is a lot of literature about the case. If the existing system gets too rigid and doesn't allow for the opportunities, then at the end of the day, if they want it or not, it will be changed. And this is what we are observing. And what we are trying to do is to have a discussion with both sides in order to make this a meaningful and productive discussion and not a confrontation. This is not a clash at the end of the day. And this is probably one of the most important things to see that I would say to take away the fears from both sides, to take away the fear from the existing system that you need not disappear, you can live with that, we can accommodate your concerns and the others that it's not confrontative, you can really show by example how it works. And there we have seen today also the consensus mechanisms, we have seen what is already now in the place. I completely agree with Jill, I know his, his product, uh, project, I like it very much, I see that communes all over the place are getting interested in this. Why only vote all four years? Why having so many people saying that my vote doesn't tell, why should I go voting? Why don't you vote in any meaningful moment whenever it is important for very small things, get people involved, get them into democracy, get them included, get them into interaction with all of this. And this is where we now discuss the fundamental principles. So that is what this discussion is actually about. And then the rest of that, frankly, regulation, whether this is this form of regulation or that form of regulation, that is secondary. I know this is provocative probably, but it's important to do that in a meaningful way, but it's not so much about regulation as such. It is about compatibility of ideas. It's about the connections between various forms of regulation. It's about finding spaces where different ideas can come together and where the interfaces are being discussed. That is the sort of regulation that we are discussing that is completely decentralized and it is completely opportunity to read. Thank you, Joachim. I will come back to you with a question, but before I do that, I, I want to ask uh, Peter and then Agatha to share their thoughts. Uh, Peter, please. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, I, know, I have nothing special to add, but I agree with Joachim and Mark raising the question, eh, when you could raise a, a digital nation state as such, uh, what would be the decision of uh, residents eh? if they could choose for their digital nation state of preference? I think there would be a lot of movement. Uh, and what does that tell us? That a lot of people aren't happy with the place that, where they are living. Uh, let's imagine that you live in Russia and you don't agree with your leader uh, doing things that the things he does. But you don't, you are captured in your country. So just an example. Um, well, that, that, that was my reflection that I wanted to share. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Agata, please. Yeah. Uh, I, I just wanted to add to what uh, Joachim was saying, and uh, I'm very glad you raised that, actually. And indeed, uh, it may seem provocative, uh, but I think you you kind of uh, hit, the, hit the kind of center nucleo, nucleus of this argument, because what this technology really represents is a general purpose technology, social technology. We very often focus on the regulatory initiatives and uh, authorities around the world are very concerned and they focus on pretty much one dimension of it, which is financial. And I think we should look beyond that. I think we're very right by saying that this is about communities. This is about social values. This is about identity. This is about self-sovereignty. And this is uh, th this is what this uh, paradigm shift um, kind of the, the one that I mentioned earlier. This is what what, it, what, it refer, what I refer to in general. This is not a, not on the paradigm shift for financial sector, where from the centralized and intermediate intermediated financial space we we kind of now. Uh, confronted with decentralized, this intermediated financial space, but it's more broader than that. It's a paradigm shift uh, for societies and for communities. And it really very much, I think, appeals to our core as human beings, because since the beginning of humanity, we gather in communities and we started to gather in communities once upon a time on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. It's only when we developed as a humanity where we started needing uh, intermediaries, where we started needing some infrastructure, institutions, and overlaid uh, sort of superior 
um, governance, but at the core, we are communities. At the core, it's human connection. And what this technology facilitates is replicate that sentiment in the digital space with the tools and mechanism that this technology provides. So this is not the tokens do not only represent your financial interests. They um, we have tools now for the tokens to represent social values, for the communities to gather around uh, around um, the identities that they can define in so many different ways. They don't have to be political. They can de be defined through other parameters, and that's why first we need to understand that, and then um, then we need to think about regulation, whether it's really needed in every, every aspect of, of this technology and shift the focus a little bit from this um, very often fear-driven approach to this technology by authorities that are confined and, and agencies that are confined to the very narrow mandates for regulation from for regulating it and that are in the specific matrix that they have been uh, appointed for and that they have been um, that they have been ma mandated to, to work uh, towards certain principles, certain aspects. But we are talking about something much broader, about social values, about social uh, structures. And, and I don't think we should forget about that. I think we should focus on that even more. Thank you, Agata. Great thoughts. Uh, I have a question that I want to address first to Joachim, and then, uh, of course, I will ask uh, the rest of the panelists to the raise their hands and share their thoughts as well. Uh, it's a question that uh, I'm paraphrasing, but we received on Slido, slido.com slash blogstart. And it pertains to, to uh, this, uh, from the perspective of this decentralization and, and bottom-up initiatives, uh, there are obviously there are initiatives on the EU level and uh, how do we solve this dichotomy and uh, also uh, of pan-EU regulation versus national initiatives in some countries, uh, both in, within the European Union and outside, they either want to control or to regulate crypto or, or other, uh, other blockchain-based solutions um, from different perspectives, from consumer protection, from, from uh, money laundering and, and whatnot. So, and, and in some cases, they want to regulate, in some cases, there's zero reg regulation or the regulation is really uh, old and, and old school and does not correspond to the modern uh, developments uh, of the 21st century. So how do we solve this, uh, this and, and uh, what is the future of this dichotomy? I think that's uh, an extremely important question, which brings the reality of, of policy making also into that discussion. There's a trade off. On the one hand side, when you just look at an eternal market, you would like to have a certain harmonization of rules. You would like to have, say, the ability to borderless uh, transact and not to be impeded by differences in national administrative rules or laws or regulation. On the other hand side, it's very clear, in my opinion, that uh, differences in regulation to a certain extent uh, can be innovative. Uh, it's not only that competition exists between companies and business models, competition also exists between regulatory approaches and that can be fruitful. And this is actually a reason why, for example, after the financial crisis, when it, came to, when it comes to the alternatives, first alternative finance crowdfunding, now the crypto space, we were very reluctant in very early regulating and harmonizing things. And I think that would have been wrong. And even here, while we pushed through Mika uh, very quickly, I think this is an approach where I've tried to explain we are already busy for five, seven, eight years in order to, uh, to work along these lines. At the end of the day, the technology moves on and all these differences, uh, in my opinion, can best be overcome by learning and by discussing and by good arguments. Uh, I have learned throughout the last 20 years in different contexts that political decisions can change very fast, actually. When alternative finance came out, you had countries that, first of all, only took a consumer protection perspective, but when they looked into the matter in a very short time frame, they suddenly became very pro-business because uh, the arguments abounded uh, around that. At the end of the day, what I think that the strong point of, of Europe is, and I mean Europe in general, 
is that this time we seem to be getting it right with the bottom-up approach because with a few exceptions and we heard mentioning Singapore but we had also many other countries in in Central America in Africa in in Asia that take a very inclusive uh, approach but the the big players as such do not take a bottom-up approach they either take a state-driven or a big tech-driven top-down approach which is not in the interest of people and we see from the interest of also areas outside uh, Europe that they take a keen interest in how we are approaching this, this crypto space. And to be very clear, this is not about the EU as such. This is not about establishing an EU border. We know from history that the big change comes from actually the smaller entities, not in the center, but at the fringes, at the, at the corners of that. Look. 500 years ago into economic history when globalization came about and i'm not saying again whether that is good or bad it was driven at that time not by the central powers but by the netherlands and portugal with actually two extremely different business models where they sent out their people to the world and then uh, discovered new markets etc um, that we all know very well this year is happening again we have a lot of uh, innovation coming from Switzerland, from Liechtenstein, from Georgia, from many other countries, and now also from small countries all over the world. The most digitized countries in the world are, and I think I get the order right, is Pakistan, India, Vietnam. We know that countries like the Philippines, El Salvador, are, I'm not saying that all of that is okay, but for example, the Philippines are a very good example now in also looking into inclusion. We need to learn from that. And we can only learn from that when we are open and we see what is possible with the technology. And again, I'm not concerned about any country now, for example, jumping into the gaps of Mika, because in Mika, we kept deliberately a lot of things relatively open, like DeFi and other spaces where we said, okay, this is a philosophy. And others interpreted that as weakness. They said, okay, hey, the people at European level are not regulating that. So we jump in and suddenly treat every little thing, every utility token as a financial instrument and completely regulate that. And that is a short term concern at the end of the day, because that is not really pro competitive, but it will disappear uh, after a while because the technical opportunities are there. It's the same about taxation. It's the same about identity. It's the same about data at the end of the day. You can prohibit certain things. You can regulate that. But there are the techniques, and I don't need to explain them here, that you can engage globally, that you can basically more or less do what you want. And then uh, I think that those countries that are more restrictive will move at the end of the day. So bottom line for that is argument, is use cases, is engaging with those that actually apply it in a decentralized way. And then I would not see any policymaker that in the long term can sustain that pressure if they oppose it. Makes sense. Thank you, Joachim. Mark, I'm sure you have thoughts about that. Also, having worked on ICA very extensively uh, within Inadva and, uh, and beyond, please. Thank you, Vitatus. Um, I, I'll, I'll try and be a little brief and, and very direct to to answer your question. And your question was about how do we get to a point where there's some degree of harmonisation or interoperability between, to a certain extent, the front runners and maybe those jurisdictions who then want to act a bit more traditionally. And you know, this might be a rather binary view, but I think competitive forces and pure, uh, pure, pure issues of competition will resolve that particular challenge. Um, Joachim suggested it you know, from the private sector, which is where I grew up. I'm not naturally a not-for-profit guy, um, but in the private sector, it was commercialization and the need for com to, to, to establish competitive advantage that drove us. And oftentimes, as private sector participants, we don't give enough consideration to the fact that those competitive forces drive regulatory jurisdictions to a certain extent as well, because they want to attract talent. With that talent comes solid businesses, comes economic development, comes the attraction of uh, you know, more residents, uh, greater opportunity for citizens, uh, and all of those benefits that come with bringing these projects to their shores. And you can't bring projects to your shores if you don't have a supportive environment. So to answer your question, I think competitive forces will naturally create that situation over time. And as industry participants, private sector, our job is to keep pushing like crazy, to educate, to engage, but never give up. Keep pushing. Don't take no for an answer because, frankly, regulators and governments need us 
more than we 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 believe ourselves. Amazing answer. Thank you, Mark. Agata, please, what how would, would you answer this question? Uh, I, I just want to refer to a few points. I'm glad that the history is brought uh, brought up again and and the competition and the competition forces. So we we're just going to have to wait and see because the history tells us that sometimes this competition is the race race to the bottom uh, among the regulators. And we've seen that with uh, with international investment law regime uh, across the world. That was, uh, you know, one of the mechanisms and tools for spreading globalization. So uh, this remains to be seen. And of course, the competition is, is a great um, incentive here for different regulatory activities, either more stringent, stringent or more relaxed. Um, and certainly what we are going to see going forward is this piecemeal divergent uh, approaches from different jurisdictions. And what that means for industry is uh, more and more layers of potential regulatory compliance that they have to tackle. And uh, this is certainly going to increase costs. It uh, invites regulatory arbitrage. And um, this is just a some a process that we all have to go through because this is still a nascent technology in terms of regulating it so there is a lot uh, a lot of lessons to be learned by regulators around the world i think europe is doing a tremendous effort and is a momentous regulation mika and uh, the end result uh, we will see what 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 is going to be the end result in terms of positioning ourselves as europe versus other uh, jurisdictional regions so it's a it's a it's a brave effort on, on the part of Europe, uh, but it's also very risky because this is a very dynamic uh, landscape, and we've been discussing Mika for one and a half years now. And <laughs> by the time Mika will be passed, and by the time it becomes effective for everybody after grandfathering period, we cannot even start to predict how technology. Uh, will will look like because it's it's just revolutionary speed versus this fairly incremental speed of regulatory efforts. So it's a fascinating time ahead. I don't think anyone can even start to predict how is it going to be how it's going to look like. But I think it's never been so active in this space as now in terms of regulatory interests, regulatory scrutiny regulatory activities for which there are no precedents. So uh, certainly very interesting times ahead. Thank you, Agata. Ian, please, uh, how would you answer this? Yes, I, I, I agree, um, Joachim, with that, you know, approach, bottom-up approach. But is there not a danger that we're always going to get the same old, same old? Um, and I'll come on to where I see that in action in real time. And, and to Mark's passionate discussion around private sector involvement, I 100% endorse that. And private and public partnership is something that all the trade associations across the globe are engaged in. And we do a lot of work with the guys um, in illicit finance at Treasury talking about the, the issues that are on politicians' mind, ransomware, for example, economic crime issues where crypto is underlying it. And then that brings me to my question. And um, yeah, as a side note, guys, congratulations on Mika. I am jealous. I want to be back in as a 28th member of the block. But yeah, that's a, that's another lobbying effort, aside from what we're already doing on the crypto asset space. Yeah, great piece of work. And that will give Europe a competitive advantage, for sure. Level playing field, passport and services. I think that's fantastic. Um, but my point is, some nations, and I'm going to name names, FinCEN, we know that these guys are pushing at the intergovernmental agency, the economic crime narrative that Bitcoin is bad, bad, bad. And that is ble bleeding into this philosophy of let's work together as a community, have this bottom up approach. So my question is, I just see risks everywhere regarding this you know, focus from certain jurisdictions um, bleeding into other areas. And we just end up with the same old, same old. Thank you, Ian. Our time is, is uh, slowly but surely running up uh, and running out, and we have about eight minutes left. So before, before um, we round up, I want to ask a very important question. 
in the light of this decentralized bottom up um, in, in, in the light of this regulation that is not probably that easy to accept not easy to understand uh, that's why a lot of you have stressed education in in your presentations uh, my question to all of you and i will ask you to to um, to uh, all of the, all of you answer that in one way or another what would be your recommendations um, particularly for first but not all, all uh, not only to the policymakers to the decision makers to the uh regulators uh, or i know the eu layer the national layer uh, that from one side so what would be your recommendations how to approach blockchain regulation from this perspective what would be the right ways um, uh, to incorporate this decentralized approach but basically if you would give have an ear and you would have an influence what would you what would you uh, advice would you give peter please uh, or is yours yeah thank you and my advice would be uh, do a lot of experiments uh, for an example at the municipality of utrecht uh, we made a game and uh, this was a game uh, let's uh, make a DAO together it, it was a, actually a physical game so we didn't implement it yet uh, but it was about defined housing how can we improve the the, the stock uh, or the, the of the, of the number of houses for, for people uh, with, with a low income. And you, uh, as, as a municipality, are one of the DAO members. And all the DAO members were the citizens and so forth. And that made really, uh, the, that it opened their eyes. So where they got involved, not only allow sandboxing or whatever, but really participate in those experiments and feel what it is to uh, act and to be a, a member of such a DAO. So that is my, my uh, suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that this Gilles that is trying to, to also speak up. Gilles, if, if that's you, can you please uh, show your video and uh, mute yourself? Is it okay? Yes. 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 Um, no. What I just wanted to to add, and uh, as you know, uh, Joachim was invited that's inviting us to talk to to regulators. Um, we, you know, we had numerous examples in this panel discussion on how you know uh, sometimes regulation comes too late or is trying to circumvent things, and there is a kind of chicken and egg or kind of running contest. Like just giving one example. At the moment in France, there's a lot of consultations happening, again, drawn by mayor on this, uh, this e-voting. And we arrive in sometimes really absurd situation where today a mayor in France, when he takes a legal decision to run a consultation, that gets illegal because it's on electronic voting and it's being cancelled. But if he does it without taking a legal step before, then that's okay, that's happening, you know. Um, I'm just giving that one example because we see it in so many other aspects of the blockchain or the crypto, where sometimes very formal differences makes a huge difference in regulation. And, and this is really driving uh, local actors crazy. So again, as uh, I, I totally appreciated the way uh, that, that it was um, uh, put forward in, in the discussion around, uh, you know, let's let the regulation be smooth and, and follow the entrepreneurs rather than the opposite. Thank you, Gilles. Ian, can I uh, can I ask you to go next and and uh, imagining this year that you have of decision makers, regulators, and maybe even uh, decentralized organizations and and uh, groups of interests uh, in different countries or 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 groups of countries? What would be your advice? How what would be the best way of the approach regulation? It's quite a, um, a difficult answer, but I'll try and be succinct because I know the clock is ticking um, here. Lots of folks in the community are advocating for a level of SRO, self-regulatory um, organization. Now, we've seen this in other areas, FX Code of Conduct for the spot market in the US and FIMA for broker dealers, crowdfunding in the UK. The nature of the industry moves at uh, such a pace, and that's by part because there is no regulatory clarity. Well, there is some regulatory clarity, but so lots of aspects are unregulated. And so you can innovate, break, build, do new things fast, uh, which is which is a positive for the development. 
But to support policymakers, we always say, look, there's you cannot issue new regulations fast, which is which is rightfully so. It takes time to issue balanced, proportionate regulation. You need to have many stakeholders give input into that. So we call for how can we as an industry support? What can we do to provide help, whether that's education at the ransomware level? Is that code of conduct? Is that self-regulatory authorities? We see that in Japan with exchanges. So that model works. And so I'll, I'll wrap up now with, I think policymakers should start sort of looking at that as an option. And as I go back to my presentation, what we're seeing is many institutions, government departments are hamstrung by outdated regulation that's not fit for purpose today in the digital age. So we, we look for a more holistic, joined up approach across different departments and across uh, different jurisdictions as well. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Agatha, please, uh, what would be your advice and recommendations? Well, I am pretty much signing up to what Gilles was saying and Ian uh, earlier. So Gilles, Gilles was saying uh, regulators to follow entrepreneurs and not the other way around. And Ian was advocating for uh, for a lot of um, a lot of education and cross agencies, cross sector, cross jurisdiction, perhaps as, as well, or surely uh, cross jurisdiction cooperation. I would probably add to that, um, but it, it comes with education as well. I think once once the education is there, then there will be an understanding that um, you know we, we can we can kind of set aside this element of fear and understand because that's very often how um, what the regulatory uh, initiatives represent or the responses from authorities represent, as we have seen in case of Libra project that a lot of aftermath of Libra was the, the fear-driven factor and the, the alarm that was raised. So I think that with the education will come an understanding that we can, we can put that fear factor to the side for a moment and understand the broader implications of this technology, the social aspect of this technology. And at the end of the day, all kinds of authorities in our existing systems uh, whether it's the regulatory bodies, whether these are some other type of authorities, they represent the, the people so that they should serve the people. And the law and regulation, uh, that should be a, a tool for social progress. So let's not uh, hold the social progress with the prohibitive or uh, incompatible or unfit for purpose regulation. Let's focus on social progress. Let's focus on public good and what, on what this technology represents in a broader social sense. That would be something I could add to everything else that's been already said. Thank you, Agata. And uh, two more uh, final thoughts before we wrap up. Uh, I also see one that indeed has a question, but unfortunately our time has already run up. So apologies for that. We, will, we won't be able to uh, to squeeze that in. Mark, please, if you if you had this proverbial ear and the access to it of regulators, policymakers, and, and maybe even bottom-up organizations, uh, what would be your recommendations to them? I think it would be to go on joint experimentation. Uh, you know, Agata made a point that resonated with me very strongly then, which, you know, frankly, regulators are there to serve their citizens. Uh, as well as protect them. And, you know, within that, it's not just about putting the brakes on uh, and putting checks and balances in places. It's about trying to create frameworks that allow the exploitation of opportunities. And those opportunities should provide benefits and value for the citizens that they're there to represent. Now, to do that requires experimentation in our space. And we're very fortunate in that we are working with a few regulators who are indeed experimenting. Um, one of these regulators has taken a batch of securities and in a trial environment has looked at how regulatory rules could be baked into the technology that underpins these securities placed on a blockchain and then looked at that as an experiment to see if they could control the actions within the parameters that they wish to set. And those types of experimentations to me are very heartening because it helps create learning in both directions. Equally, the concept of building secondment programs, 
whereby we take shining talent from the private sector, maybe move them for a period of time into the public sector and have a pathway in the opposite direction from public sector into the private sector to begin sharing those learnings, sharing the vernacular, because there is a very different language and approach to language that is used, which requires some, some translation at times so that we can create an understanding and something as simple as that barrier in language can not allow a full understanding and really fruitful collaboration to be established. So uh, in, in fact, the test has to, to, to be a little direct we're doing more than imagining utopia in ATPA. We're actually working on some of these programs and helping regulators to develop these programs and connect with the private sector. Now, time will tell when we're back here in 12 months time as to whether we've made progress or not, but it's not through lack of trying. Thank you, Mark. That gives us hope. Joachim, please, uh, your Last but not least today, what are your thoughts and recommendations? Yes, two things. And the first, I can be extremely brief because you all said it, experimentation, uh, use cases. I would say, especially to regulators, policymakers, make your hands dirty, get into the details, have projects. Many of my colleagues have, actually. And we started, when we started doing blockchain work, we realized how many people were already in a private environment, busy with these things, understood where the bottlenecks are, understood where the very strange uh, constraints are. This is of utmost importance. And I'm very happy to see from, from all of you and from the examples that so many are working along these lines and are happy to engage with regulators and policymakers along this line. And the last thing that I would like to, to say actually on top of that is listen to your children. We have, as said, 3 billion uh, gamers. And I must say, I'm now moving after this exciting conference to a workshop I'm organizing on the metaverse where we have a lot of use cases, interestingly, also bottom up. And I just mentioned one use case because I find it telling. Uh, there's someone from a startup who is working together with uh, fashion designers to, let's say, design clothes for avatars. And uh, that's a very environmentally driven startup, seemingly. So um, they realize that there are people who would like to have a different dress every day. And in order not to produce all that stuff, wear it once and then throw it away. Uh, you just give it to your avatar and then you can whatever game you play uh, you can uh, dress your avatar according to this design and also the fashion maker gets some some money so digitalization allows for that and i found that exciting to see and when i was talking to my 16 year old son he looked a bit bored and said that well we all know this is around and you can do this or that and that i mean the next generation is, is growing up with this stuff. They see it as an everyday thing in their life. They see it as self-evident. They don't want to listen to old stories from old history and old wars and things like that. And this is an enormous power that we can bring with us. And I think this is probably the biggest responsibility that we have as policymaker and regulators, everyone in the space, that we need to really give that new generation the opportunity to, to do these things and learn how it can also have effects in, in real life, how you can make a living out of that, how you can combine actually normal things like production and services, etc., with this sort of innovation in the digital space. And this is exciting. And this is my, my really last remark. Um, we should not think too much about ourselves and what we think is important and like. I mean, there is there's a huge wave coming up who will do it anyway, and we can teach them how to do it neatly, how to do it profoundly, how to do it in a way that respects also other, other views. And that is the key responsibility that we have. Again, completely decentralized, but really this is the task for policymakers and regulators to look at that generation. Thank you, Joachim. Thank you, Joachim. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Agatha. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Gilles. Thank you, everyone who has joined today. And uh, before, uh, before I say our uh, final goodbyes, there are two things that I want to uh, bring up. Uh, the first thing is that uh, uh, at three o'clock today, 3 p.m. CET, uh, we are having a demo day of blockchain program. Uh, the final, very final event of the program that lasted for over two years. So I invite everyone to participate. Um, if you don't have a, a link, you can go to blockstart.eu. There's a demo day button right on the top and you can uh, watch uh, watch the live uh, live broadcast and the second thing uh, one final uh, request to ask of you is just to share our feedback about this event uh, we appreciate your thoughts uh, what went well what could be improved 
And uh, you can do that on slido.com slash blog site. Please uh, give us your feedback as a, as a payback for, for this nice discussion. Once again, thank you for your amazing uh, inputs, a lot of great thoughts, uh, and hope that all this helps to move uh, the world of blockchain forward. Thank you very much, and uh, until next time. Thank you. Bye, everybody.